Good morning, everybody. It is August 3rd, 9 a.m. And I will now call to order the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Peterson. Present. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Montesino. Here. Commissioner Hernandez. Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin. Here. Commission Alternate Quinn. Here. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Here. Commissioner Kudolis Carter. Here. Commissioner Rotkin. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. And I see Commissioner Sandy Brown coming up now, as well as Commissioner Johnson. I think that's everyone. Uh, so I'm assuming we don't have any AB 2449 requests. I'm sorry, uh, Chair Koenig uh, and Commissioner Eads. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, of course. Um, do we have any additions or deletions to the consent or regular agendas today? Uh, Chair Koenig, we have no additions or deletions, but we do have um, a couple of replacement pages for item 15 and handouts for items 24 and 27. And those are posted to our website. Thank you. Proceed with item four, oral communications. Any member of the public may address the commission on any item within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not already on the agenda. The commission will listen to all communication, but in compliance with state law, it may not take action on items that are not on the agenda. Speakers are requested to state their name clearly, so it may be accurately recorded in the minutes of the meeting. We'll begin with folks here in the board chamber. Is there anyone who wish to address the commission? If so, approach the podium. Seeing none, is there anyone online? Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian Peoples from Trail Um, This is a photo that showing, uh, that illustrate, uh, I've submitted a photo. You can see the photo. It's uh, the tracks along Park Ave and the statement from Supervisor McPherson that the RTC is going to ask the close commission if uh, last year, what we can build along the coastal corridor. When you look at the coastal corridor, coastal commission requirements and their past decisions on other coastal approvals, it's well understood there's limited what we can build on there. The tracks are located feet, feet from the Pacific Ocean in many locations. Park Avenue is uh, located on the cliff and 60 trains a day along this fragile cliff is not the best ideal. The coastal and sea level rising requirements what can we do with it? One of the requirements for the Coastal Act is providing access, beach access. So when you think about what you put there, such as a train, you have huge barriers, fencing, which would prevent access to the beach. And that's one of the, the main criteria of the Coastal Act, which will restrict what we're allowed to build there. So I'd like to hear if RTC staff is going to follow up with Supervisor McPherson's request last year to ask them if what we can build them. And please ensure that you specifically state, can we have huge fencing and barriers that would prevent access to the beach? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peebles. Mr. Michael Saint. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Chair Koenig and Commissioners. Michael Saint, the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Uh, climate change is real. It is happening now. It is driven by humans. It is accelerating less than 2.2% of peer-reviewed climate science papers dispute these facts. Climate change impacts include greater threats of extreme weather events, sea level rise, regional water scarcity, heat waves, wildfires, and destruction of biological systems. Yet we as a society put our heads in the sand and ignore what is happening to our planet. When I started my advocacy work seven years ago, my first public talk was right here and I remember Supervisor Zach Friend welcoming me to the RTC meeting and thanking me for participating during public comment. I was hoping to have an impact and to help Santa Cruz County become a leader in the fight against climate change and help the RTC build a future transportation system that would be a shining example to the rest of the world. Talk about being naive. 
I had uh, very limited experience in the workings of local, state, and federal systems and the world of politics. After a few years of continuing to try and pull certain commissions along to help mitigate the effects of climate change, I realized these entities were just checking the box, entitled public comment, and pressing forward with their agenda. Needless to say, I became somewhat jaded with this reality, but I'm still hopeful. I look for leaders who have a cut commitment to lead us out of business as usual. I fight this inner feeling of disappointment and that my words mean nothing when I do public comment. But yet, I'm still that naive advocate down deep inside and I want to make the world a better place and a safer place to live. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Thank you for continuing to show up. We have no other speaker. <clears throat> speaker. All right, then we'll end public comment and proceed with the consent agenda. This is items five through 20. Does any commissioner have questions or comments on the consent agenda? Yeah, uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, comment on item number 10. <clears throat> I want to commend the and thank the RTC staff for their diligence and patience to develop uh, the partnership of five public agencies that created this collaborative study to uh, improve Highway 9 between the downtown of Felton and Glen Arbor Road. Uh, it involved Caltrans, the RTC, the county, Metro, and the San Lorenzo Valley School District. Uh, and they worked together to create the study which will facilitate uh, a leveraged funding and a phased approach to building improvements. Uh, my office started working on this more than 10 years ago when I was first elected uh, because of the daily school traffic and unfortunately we had one fatality on that stretch. I uh, really appreciate the support of the commission. Uh, it's given this project uh, and I know it will make a significant difference for decades to come in the San Lorenzo Valley. Uh, this project uh, probably will, will not really get going until 2024, probably 2025. But uh, I want to just appreciate, say how much I appreciate the collaborative effort to make, uh, make this a reality in the San Lorenzo Valley and in, this, in, in particular the Felton area. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, is there any public comment on the consent agenda? Seeing none, I'll turn to the Commission for Action. Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Commissioner Rockin, second by Commissioner Schifrin to adopt the consent agenda. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, I guess we still have to do a roll call vote. No, do you we? can do it, boys. We can? All right, then all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That was refreshing. Great. <laughs> All right, the uh, consent agenda passes unanimously. We'll proceed with the regular agenda. Commissioner reports. Does any commissioner have a report they'd like to share? Commissioner Rockin. Uh, Supervisor McPherson and I have talked about this before we got to the meeting. On, on Highway 9, um, the commission and all the other partners we've been involved in have done a really great job of dealing, addressing the traffic issues between Felton, actually a little, a little bit south of Felton, and up to Boulder Creek, but there's a problem that's going in the other direction between Felton and Santa Cruz. Every weekend, there are like, this is not an exaggeration, 250, 300 cars parked along the road. I'd say over half of them are on the actual pavement because there's no parking spaces there. There's only two parking lots, small ones, at the two state park locations. Um, there are no public restrooms. And weekdays, there's maybe, I'm, I don't know the exact numbers there, but more like 150 people or something that are in there. No restrooms, no control of parking. Um, it's not that nobody's doing anything. <laughs> I'm sure there are resource limitations and state parks can, that's, that land is owned by state parks, most of it. Um, limits for what they can do, they're involved in other things. But I, I'd like to get something going where someone looks at that and starts a process of trying to figure out what might be done because it's dangerous. Cars are forced into the other lane to get around those parked cars and they're there both Saturday and Sunday. Again, hundreds of cars and, uh, and the sanitation issues that are involved I think are worth the Parks Department probably responsible for that, but somebody needs to deal with it. Um, and so I, what I'd like is to us to send um, 
a letter of some kind, or a formal letter of some sort to uh, Caltrans and to the state parks, just to notify them of this problem and maybe start some process going. Again, I'm not trying to say anybody's done anything wrong because there are, sure, lim I'm sure, resource limitations, but something needs to be done to address this. Mc uh, Supervisor McPherson may have some stuff to add. I also want to say there's somewhat similar situation on Fall Creek Road, or in, um, a Felton Empire. If you go about a mile up from Highway 9, there's a big parking lot up there. No restroom facilities, but the cars are parked along the road, parked on the pavement. Again, it's not just up against the pavement. They got wheels up on the pavement, and so there's not room for a car to pass without going into the oncoming lane. So someone needs to look at this. And I mean, a lot's been, it's sort of somewhat like the situation up on Highway 1, up near, um, um, you know, where, where uh, the road coming down from Body Dune, come, Body Dune Road comes down. So something needs to be done to address it because there's going to be a horrible accident up there at some point if someone doesn't doesn't address this in some way. Maybe Bruce has something to add. Yeah, I just uh, recognize that, especially this summer and uh, especially on Highway 9. And I don't, I, I know that there's limitations uh, of what could be done there. Uh, and we have the problem of some of these areas being featured in the New York Times at times. <laughs> Stuff like so, it really is a drawing card for a lot of people uh, to come uh, to the San Lorenzo Valley or the lower valley between Felton and Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, I don't know what can be done, but if there can some be some accommodation, it's just purely for safety pur pur purposes or con uh, considerations. I don't know if. Uh, we may might write a letter to Caltrans and state parks to see if there might be a cooperative effort of some type to provide more parking or sanitation facilities, something of that nature. Um, I, it's it's not a, a huge reach, and I don't expect a, a huge uh, parking structure to be put up in the in, in the uh, redwood trees. But uh, it is something that is of concern, and the, the parks uh, the the cars are parked in the. Uh, on the highway itself. And as far as Felton Empire, the same goes, which is a county road, of course. Uh, I think they, they both uh, deserve some attention to see if, if what possibilities, if any, we could do to improve that situation. Thank you. I'm happy to work with both uh, Commissioner McPherson and Rodkin to maybe draft a letter and put it on a future consent agenda for approval. That'd be great. Thanks. Right. Any other comments from commissioners? All right, seeing none, we'll proceed with the director's report. Executive Director Preston. Thank you, Chair Koenig and commissioners. Um, I have a quick status update on storm damage repair projects on the Santa Cruz branch rail line. Uh, first, all emergency down tree removals are complete. Uh, field work on the emergency embankment washout repair project, and that was two locations, is also complete. Um, the debris removal is partially complete. The phase one emergency portion of the debris removal and erosion control project um, will, should be completed this month, but uh, phase two uh, removal and erosion control work is going to be rebid, and that was uh, explained and authorized in item 12 on today's agenda. Uh, engineering design for the remaining storm damage repairs, including the damaged bridge uh, at New Brighton, are underway. Uh, staff has been coordinating with FEMA uh, throughout the uh, pub through their public assistance program, which should provide reimbursement for the majority of RTC repair costs. Um, I have some comments I would like to make about the Measure D annual report, which was item 16 on today's consent agenda. The annual report is a requirement in the Measure D ordinance requiring that an oversight committee provide an annual report to the public regarding expenditures and audits. The report not only provides the public with a safeguard regarding compliance, but also provides an opportunity for RTC to document the progress achieved in delivering the Measure D expenditure plan. I want to thank the voters for having the faith in RTC to administer the program and staff for their excellent work in delivering the program, as well as the commission for its thoughtful decision-making. As for the work in completing the report itself, uh, my appreciation goes to all uh, RTC staff for their contributions, but especially Shannon Muntz for leading staff support to the Taxpayer Oversight Committee. Additionally, five private individuals donated their time and effort to work on the report. Thank you, TOC members uh, uh, Gail Jack, David Culver, Philip Hudson, uh, Trina Kaufman-Gomez, and TOC Chair Andre Duvort. 
Uh, this is not glamorous work and their commitment to public service is both appreciated and commended. We'd like to now call your attention to our legislative update, uh, which was item eight on today's consent agenda. The report includes some very good news for transit in California, recently approved in the state budget. The budget included $4 billion for a new uh, 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 transit and inner city rail capital uh, uh, program and um, $1.1 billion for a new zero emission transit capital program. The $1.1 billion uh, for the new zero emission uh, program is meant to help revision transit to help California meet its greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. That funding will be distributed to RTC for programming by formula based on both population and transit revenue generated within the county. The exact amount that RTC will receive will depend on what revenue is used for the calculation, but it is expected to be between seven and $10 million. I expect the new zero emission funds will be programmed to our transit agencies, uh, eligible expenditures such as fleet conversion. We are awaiting the program's guidelines and we'll provide more information as it becomes available. The $4 billion in new uh, TERSIP, or Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program formula funding will also be directed to RTC by formula. The formula will be based on population only. This funding is expected to be fairly flexible and RTC will be responsible for determining how the new TERSIP formula funding will be programmed to meet the uh, program's guidelines. Eligible expenditures are expected to include transit operations, which is important to our transit operators. Additionally, eligible pre-construction project development costs for capital projects will also be allowable. These two allowances are unusual but welcome in that it addresses two historical needs that are typically not included in many traditional transit funding programs. This provides a unique opportunity for the Commission to consider where best to program the region's estimated $27 million share to meet our transit priority needs. RTC staff is monitoring the, the guidelines um, as they are developed by the California State Transportation Agency. Staff welcomes Commissioner's thoughts and comments on these new funding programs. I have a staffing uh, announcement to uh, report out. Um, Matt Schroeder, who came to RTC about a year ago as a planner one, has left RTC to take a senior planner position with the city of Campbell. Although Matt only worked here a year, he made an impact and we will miss him. His last work was on the legislative report, which I addressed earlier in today's report. Finally, I have my own announcement to make. After a very dynamic and fulfilling 34 years in transportation planning, programming, engineering, and project delivery, I have decided that on December 1st, I will pack up my empty coffee, coffee thermos, jump on my bike, and ride home from RTC office for the last time. RTC has made great progress, and I am very proud of our accomplishments. It is now time for me to retire and spend more time at home. Tanya and I have always known that we would retire here in Santa Cruz, we are well settled and I have a long list of home projects to keep me busy while I ease into this new chapter of my life. We love it here in Santa Cruz and I hope to see you enjoying a newly built segment of the rail trail as we plan to do. I want to thank RTC commissioners, staff and the public for their support that I received while working here at RTC. The commission has achieved monumental successes and I believe RTC's program is well positioned for more groundbreaking achievements. And with that, I conclude my director's report. Thank you, Director Preston. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? Mr. Chair, I'd just like to say that uh, I've been on this commission for 10 years and I have never experienced more uh, success stories on projects and getting projects delivered than we have under Guy Preston. He has been phenomenal, I think, in trying to get people together in some very, uh, Controversial issues, uh, in particular the rail trail. Uh, it, uh, uh, we've had split votes and so forth, and he has always been ha had a measured approach and delivery of what can be done and what is being done. I, I, uh, I just can't say how much I've appreciated his professional uh, presentations and his uh, 
his consideration of uh, what this board or commission or this county wants to do in our transportation network. Uh, he's been terrific with working with the state and federal agencies as well. Uh, we are very lucky to have had him as our executive director for these years. And I dutifully uh, appreciate your professional attitude and your um, success in delivering, helping us deliver projects uh, for the people of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. You're here. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Johnson. I, w I was gonna ask a technical question, but I think I was kind of blindsided by this announcement. So I'll forego that and maybe talk later. Commissioner Schiffrin. Yeah, I just want to uh, <clears throat> agree with what Commissioner McPherson said and uh, just say I'm really saddened that you're going to be retiring. I think you've done an amazing job and the commission's been incredibly successful under your leadership. Um, I wish there was some way to persuade you to stay on. There's still so much to be done. Um, but I think um, I know I'm very appreciative of all the that's been accomplished under your leadership. So. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer. Commissioner Brown. Sorry. Um, well, I'll, I'll just add my appreciation. I'm, there will be more to say um, as uh, you make the transition. So I'll keep it brief. But, I, you know, I just want to say that in my experience, uh, both on the commission and, and just in public service, uh, more broadly, working with you and in particular last year as chair when I got to know you and, and talk with you regularly, um, your um, your commitment, your your expertise, and the way that you uh, do this work, engage with us as commissioners to help us understand what's going on, and and the way that you have been um, so effective in uh, delivering projects for our community is just it's phenomenal, and um, we'll miss you so very much. Um, you know, also just working with you personally, I, I felt that you're so responsive to commissioners, um, you're generous with your time, and you are, you know, it really, um, you know, one of the best leaders of a public agency that I've, I've ever worked with in my, um, albeit seven years, <laughs> um, and uh, you, you'll really be missed. So um, I wish we could persuade you to stay. It sounds like you're set on retiring, and that also sounds wonderful for you. So congratulations. We'll see you on the trail. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Rockin. I just want to add as someone who's been on and off the commission for the last 30 years that um, your job here has been phenomenal. And the specific job you had, which is needs to be noted, is the shift of this commission from being, um, it's not that it's not anything, but uh, simply a planning agency to an agency that actually runs, you know, delivers projects. Uh, it was critically important, and I think that transition is something you handled amazingly well. Um, I, I'm blindsided by this as well. I'm, I'm used to, at this point now, having such great access. You know, you're, you're always available to talk and um, uh, respond to situations, and it, it's, you've done a really, really wonderful job here, and I think you're definitely going to be missed. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner Rockin. Commissioner Hernandez. It's on. This lights are really dim here. You know, I, I want to echo some of the comments that were made as well. Um, you know, we've got to. I appreciate that that you took that you took us um, as a new RTC member when I came in initially. You gave me a tour of the different sites and explained to me a lot about you know uh, about being an RTC commissioner as well and some of the issues that we we're facing. Uh, but I really want to thank you, though, for, you know, the projects that were delivered. I think there's a lot of outcomes for South County, especially uh, the, you know, the Highway 1 project, uh, different projects that we've got uh, in, in coordination with Caltrans as well. So thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. I know all of us up here could go on and on and on about, um, I mean, I, I think Sadness truly really is the overriding emotion for me at hearing uh, this announcement. Um, as has been said, I think you really helped move this 
uh, organization light years forward, bringing your uh, engineering expertise as well as your knowledge and understanding of uh, the state funding environment. And uh, we're seeing those projects delivered now, um, beginning to be, uh, as we're about to get an update on. Um, certainly wish you could hang out longer and, and see and help us see uh, see more of them to completion. Of course, you will continue to be in the community, which is great news. Um, and I'm sure well, uh, many of us will be reaching out to you informally for um, thoughts on one thing or another, um, but definitely leave some big shoes to fill. So thank you for all your service to this organization. And uh, again, I'm sure we'll be having more uh, items to discuss and celebrate your, your service here. Are there any public comments? on the commissioner, or sorry, on the executive director's report. Seeing none here in chambers, is there any online? Okay, thank you. Then we'll proceed with item 23, the Caltrans report. Director Eads. All right. Well, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. Pleasure to be here today, and I'm caught by surprise at this as well. And. Um, just want to say it's been really terrific working in partnership with uh, Director Preston and his staff. I think he's the wealth of experience that he's brought into this position and just the recognition of the complexity of the project development process and what we're dealing with and the ability to really work in partnership to get some stuff done and um, has been terrific and look forward to continuing the progress that we've made and the momentum that we have. All right, I have an announcement as well, um, but I'm not retiring. Um, so uh, the, there's a new district, uh, deputy district director for transportation planning and local assistance backfilling my previous position in District 5. So Brandy Ryder is stepping into that role. She has a wealth of experience in planning, environmental planning and project management that she's bringing into that position. Um, she's been working most recently in um, transportation planning, has been doing a great job. So. Um, you'll, you have actually seen her here, I think, attending some of these meetings um, she, since she served in the acting role in the deputy position in the past, um, but um, you'll be seeing her more here. So, And then just a few other announcements and then I'll talk about storm damage. Um, a, climate option, a climate adaptation planning grant workshop is being held um, or scheduled within District 5. So it's a District 5 focus on August 16th from 1.30 to 3 p.m and it's focusing on the upcoming second cycle. Applications are due in January, 2024. There's about almost $32 million available. And so uh, it's a good opportunity and the workshop is intended for all eligible entities, which would be MPOs, RTPAs, tribal governments, cities, counties, and transit agencies. So anybody's welcome um, that is an applicant to, is willing to sit, uh, welcome to sit in on that workshop and try to tee that up for some funding opportunities. All right, there are several permanent storm damage repairs underway on Santa Cruz State Highways. So just to explain a little bit of the, um, our process. So when we, have, when we lose access to a highway due to a slide or a washout or um, uh, some other emergency situation, we do what we can to quickly reestablish the roadway. And sometimes that takes months, as you know. But um, in, in some cases, we're able to reestablish the roadway quickly with a temporary fix. And then we work towards um, moving directly into a process to design a permanent fix and then construct the permanent fix. And so we, that's what we've been up to in some situations um, where we were not able to put the t permanent fix in um, initially. And um, then there's also a landscape project that will follow oftentimes um, in either situation to, to address the um, whatever has been taken out um, from a landscape perspective. So um, a few of those that I'd like to highlight that are upcoming, we're trying to get these permanent fixes in this year before another series of storms potentially hits this, this winter. So um, just to highlight some of these that are happening now or will be shortly in the future. So we have one called the so SoCal Creek Bridge Scour Protection Project. That's a mouthful. It's happening right now. It's on Highway 1 um, and you've probably seen some intermittent um, ramp closures to the north to the Bayport or northbound on ramp. Um, so work is happening there. It's um, probably a little confusing because it's not clear which is the construction work um, on Highway One for the ox lanes and what is this. But nonetheless, that's what's happening there. 
And again, we'll have some a planning project that will follow. We anticipate completing construction by October 30th on this one, but there will be some other activities that will continue beyond that. And then on 236, we have a significant closure that needs to occur to put in some permanent fixes. Um, it'll be a full closure um, and there's detours around Big, Big Basin State Park and Highway 9 and our estimated construction date is beginning this week all the way through December. So appreciate everybody's patience on that. Um, some information went out with more detailed information about um, alternative routes and access. Highway 35 at post mile three, which is pier around Bear Creek Road. We have, a, um, this is upcoming. So in September 11th is when we anticipate starting that. And then the improvements will continue through January. Again, a full closure is being planned at that location. And we, um, the closure would not go all the way to January. So we're looking at um, up through November, mid, mid November for that closure. And then there will be some one way traffic control after that. And uh, the detour on that will be Skyline Boulevard and Bear Creek Road at this point in time, but we're we'll be coordinating with the county on that. And then Highway 9, um, Jane's Wall, um, we're familiar with that slide. So we have an estimated start date on that of um, mid-October, October 23rd, and that'll continue into early next year. And a full closure again will be needed there for a period of time. And, uh, and then some one-way traffic control following. And then again on Highway 9, um, we have uh, at post mile 22, um, a, a single lane will be open at all times. So that's another project that we'll be um, working to do a permanent restoration, but we will be able to have traffic control there. So I know that's a lot. Thank you for your patience. We're trying to get these in before the next series of storms hit. Um, these are important. And as I mentioned, you're gonna see some follow on landscaping work at each of these locations. That concludes my report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Director Eads. And I'll just, uh, I, I would have questions, but you um, probably answered a bunch of them over email for me uh, about the SoCal Creek Bridge Scour Repair Project, um, which uh, surprised some of my constituents that live down there by SoCal Creek. But uh, I think those are all very comprehensive answers. And just wanted to thank you for those. Commissioner Schiffrin. Yes, a couple of questions. One is a follow-up on the 236 closure. Uh, Commissioner Cummings was contacted about uh, that, concerned about that, and had a couple of questions. You answered one in terms of how long it's going to be, but the other question is, is there any possibility of allowing um, passage at certain times of the day? Um, does it have to be a sort of permanent 24-hour closure, or could there be times when it, the road could be open? Thanks, Commissioner Schifrin, through the chair. Um, my understanding is we need to close it fully um, in order to get the work done as quickly as we can. So that's the challenge with any of these locations. If you're, if you're trying to work in a situation where there's live traffic happening, um, we often do that in many locations, but if we're able to get in and just get the work done, um, it, we're able to do it more efficiently and get it get out of there more quickly. Um, in this particular situation, to answer your question more fully, I'm not certain, but I know that they have considered different options and this is the one that they feel like is the best way to get the work done efficiently and effectively. Um, they will be working with local, and all of these locations will be working with local emergency response providers to make sure that um, should there be an incident or something and a need to have access that we would be, you know, doing what we can to accommodate that um, and anticipating the fact that there, these closures will be occurring. So happy to talk in more detail about that specific location and if there's things that can be done um, at this point in time, that was our plan. I think the concern was that if the work isn't going to be done at night, whether there was any way to allow for, you know, that kind of access from the people who live up there or... Yeah, I understand. It, Usually the issue is it's a construction zone with, right. you know, impassable conditions. Yeah. But you are willing to check it out? Certainly willing to talk about it, yeah, absolutely. Okay. The other question I have is a follow-up from an uh, issue I raised last meeting, uh, which is about Sharksfin uh, Cove on Highway 1. 
And I do appreciate Caltrans getting back. And we've been trying to set up a meeting with Caltrans, as I'm sure you know, to really talk about it. But I wanted to tell you and the commission, this is one that really follows from what was said earlier uh, about the danger on Highway 9. It's a very serious public, um, public safety issue. And uh, during the weekend, even during the week, people park on the road. And it's extremely dangerous at that as you know, in terms of Highway 1. As I understand it, uh, Caltrans owns the right of way where off-road uh, off parking could be sort of formalized. Uh, I was at a meeting on uh, Monday talking about a variety of North Coast projects, and this one was one that got received a lot of attention. And the Caltrans representative was you know, sort of, there was seemed to be agreement that the where the parking should be pro provided is in the Cal is part of the Caltrans right of way, but the group was told that Caltrans has no money to build um, parking lots. There's no funding source for that. So, uh, I guess a question I had, and uh, talking to Supervisor um, and Commissioner Cummings, he this is a, a concern of his. Um, would there be a possibility, and I guess maybe this is also a question for, for our staff, of uh, adding some money to or uh, including a project in the next round of um, uh, STIP funding, one of the various sources that would be able to fund that project? And since it's on the Caltrans right of way, logically, um, Caltrans should be the lead agency. Is is it something that if the if the could Caltrans submit a, a, a project for STIP funding for that location um, that if the commission approves it and the CTC approves it could really provide assistance in carrying out a project at that location, um, even though it's not part of what Caltrans normally funds or has other funding for. So I guess that's my question number one. And if the answer to that is no, um, what other agencies do you think could possibly uh, apply for funding that uh, could co coordinate with Caltrans to carry out the project? Since it's in the Caltrans right of way, um, it really makes most sense, at least to me, to have Caltrans do the project. Happy to happy to take that answer or answer that question. So, um, in terms of the the funding source, um, Caltrans probably wouldn't be the applicant for STIP funding because they'd probably be talking about RTIP funding, which is actually programmed through SEC RTC. Um, there, Caltrans does can apply for ITIP funding, but that's really interregional, interregionally focused. So it probably wouldn't be a good candidate for that funding source for these kind of improvements. Either either way, whatever funding source could be found, Caltrans is happy to um, work with RTC in terms of who's the best implementing agency. Um, I don't think there's anything precluding Caltrans from being the implementing agency on something like that. We would have, you know, want to make sure we're on the same page in terms of future maintenance um, and the facility, you know, like we already talked about with the informal parking, the same kinds of challenges can sometimes play out with formal parking where you have, if you don't have restrooms or you have trash that accumulates, things like that. So um, those, those are the kind of questions we'd want to work out, but I don't see a reason why Caltrans could not be an implementing agency. Um, either way, we'd be working with others to partner on funding and um, I don't, I'm not aware of a funding source that Caltrans has available, but we could certainly work to talk about what could be, what funding sources might apply and then work out the details in terms of ownership and maintenance and implementing agency. Okay. Well, I, as I understand it, the county could submit an application. Um, I'm wondering, could the RTC submit an application as one of its program projects? I know that you have a very significant workload, but um, there is a good deal of concern, and it does appear to be a significantly dangerous public safety problem. And, and if I could add to this particular item, this is a common situation, especially in coastal areas like the Big Sur Coast. We have some really challenging ongoing parking issues related to a state park down there as well. I think it's a state park or maybe it's a county park. 
either way, um, this is an ongoing challenge where we have areas of high demand and Caltrans, you know, isn't really in the parking business, but it's, there's challenges that are happening on a right of way. And sometimes those are, you know, a trash accumulation, sometimes it's safety, sometimes there's operational implications. So either way, we wanna be a partner, but we don't see ourselves as the full solution. So in all of these cases, we're usually working with, uh, you know, local stakeholders to identify what is the appropriate um, next steps and and who's, you know, jointly responsible for or separately responsible for carrying those things out. So we're happy to partner in these situations, certainly important, and we recognize that these things can be challenging in terms of the situations that are there. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I just want to say a thank you to Caltrans. Um, on the aforementioned Highway 1 project, um, there's a group of property owners there that are going to be heavily impacted in their parking, uh, it, which is in the, the state uh, right-of-way. And I just want to say how much I appreciate uh, members of uh, representatives from Caltrans meeting with the property owners and me to work out something that I think is going to be accommodating to all. Um, and then secondly, on the 236, yeah, there was a, a lumber company that uh, was just needed another 30 days. I know you're, you considered it fully, and I just want to say appreciate you got right back to them and said this is what, what it's like, but what, what we can do and what we can't do. So uh, they've been very responsive to requests uh, from individual property owners on some state highway projects, and I, it's very much appreciated. If I could, through the chair, Please. just quickly say, I meant to say it earlier, in your packet where we have the, the project updates, there's page 15 through 17 or 18 or so, there's a whole list of resources. <clears throat> so we know you're getting inquiries constantly on these projects and there's a lot happening. So please, I would encourage you to, you know, even send that list of resources to your constituents when there's questions, because there's a lot of resources there in terms of folks that you can go to. If there's maintenance service requests, you see something that needs to be addressed from a, you know, trash or maintenance standpoint, there's a place to, to um, enter those. And there's also, if there's inquiries of any kind in terms of project updates or either even lane closure charts where you can see the look ahead for the next year, ne next week in terms of what the upcoming lane closures are. So there's a lot of information there I'd encourage you to look at when you have a chance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Commissioner Hernandez. Yes, um, I wanted to get the date for the, for the workshop that's happening. Is it August 16th or 15th? One, one to 16th. 16th, and it's from one to? 1.30 to three. 1.30, 1.30, 1.30. And also, um, who would be a contact person for any uh, like issues that arise uh, or concerns or questions or uh, anything like that for like, or delays that we might have like on, on like 152, uh, a, con a contact person for uh, highway, for Caltrans? Uh, so I, I think our PIO office or public information office is probably a good starting point because they're familiar with the construction activities and there's different leads and different areas. So I would say it's, again, it's in your packet. Kevin Drabinski is absolutely terrific. He's in our PIO office and his contact information is listed on page, I think, 15 of the packet. Thank you. All right, seeing no other commissioner questions or comments, was there any member of the public wishes to comment on the Caltrans report? We do not have any raised hands. Okay, great. Thank you, Director Eads. Now, I know we have a public hearing scheduled for 9.30 a.m. and we're running a little bit behind, um, but we're also teed up for the update on Highway 1. So, so okay, let's um, proceed with the public hearing. This is item 25, draft 2023 public participation plan for the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, the Council of San Benito County Governments, the Santa, <coughs> Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission and the Transportation Agency for Monterey County. Uh, Good morning, yeah. commissioners. I'm Shannon Munns, communication specialist on your staff. So every four years, a public participation plan is federally required to be updated and approved by metropolitan planning organizations and regional transportation planning agencies. The draft 2023 public participation plan has been prepared by the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments in collaboration with 
the RTC, the Council of San Benito County Governments, and the Transportation Agency for Monterey County. This draft plan complies with applicable federal and state legislation, including the current Federal Transportation Act, Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, which was enacted in 2015, and the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act Bipartisan Infrastructure Act of 2021. Additionally, under the California Transportation Commission's 2017 Regional Transportation Plan Guidelines, a documented public involvement process should be prepared prior to each regional transportation plan and agency's development of its regional transportation plan. The purpose of this public participation plan is to establish the process by which the public can participate in transportation planning, programming, and project implementation. The draft 2023 public participation plan incorporates strategies to ensure that to the greatest extent possible, interagency consultation and public participation are an integral part of the regional transportation planning and decision-making process. Public participation activities provide a feedback loop for projects to inform and vet issues in the project planning and development stages, which help mitigate issues early on. Once this plan is adopted by the RTC, the 2023 public participation plan will serve as the RTC's official public participation, public participation plan for the four year period from 2023 to 2027. In particular, this plan will play a key role in, in the public outreach strategy for the development of the 2050 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, key sections of this plan are a public participation plan guiding principles, incorporating limited English proficiency populations into public participation, um, public participation processes and development, a list of interested parties that we would work with on public engagement in the community, and then online and vis visualization outreach strategies. AMBAG and the three RTPs worked together to restructure the previously adopted 2019 public participation plan to make the plan more useful for transportation decision making in the Monterey Bay region. The 2023 plan also includes a new section on equity with public engagement methods to increase equitable participation and distribution of resources in all outreach efforts, projects, and programming. So we are currently soliciting public input on the draft plan and comments received by August 2023 will be considered during the development of the final plan. Um, we also have Heather Adamson from AMBAG here today to answer any additional questions along with myself. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Munz. Other comments or questions from members of the commission? <coughs> Seeing none. Any members of the public? Oh, I guess I will officially open the public hearing. Any members of the public that wish to comment on the draft participation plan? Seeing none here in chambers, is there anyone online? I do not see any hands raised. Okay, then I will close the uh, public hearing and uh, bring it, I guess, back to the commission. I don't, is this just an information item? It's, it's just, since there wasn't any public comment, it's worth noting this is a really fine job. I mean, it really does uh, set out a way to make sure the public is involved in these decisions. And obviously that's critically important. So I, I would just want to at least say something publicly that it, this is not work that just went onto the shelf or something. This is going to affect how we hold our public hearings and do outreach work with the community. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And we have received public comment um, through email and all that. So we, we have heard some things from the public that we will be incorporating as well, so. Yes, Director Brown, or sorry, Commissioner Brown. I'll just add that we did at, at AMBAG have a presentation about this and there was some discussion. Um, and, and I also wanna thank you for a very comprehensive plan and your great work I have there, back there. Um, I, um, I, the couple of the things that came up there that I just wanna, I think I'll make a comment about here. One was related to how we do social media, all of our agencies and, and the, the, the way that that um, can 
or cannot or does not does or does not uh, really elicit f increased uh, engagement. So I think that was and and we had a good conversation about that. I think that's something that we want to be thinking about and focusing on as well as that list of um, you know CBO community based partners who can help uh, get this out into the community and, and get um, people involved who are not really traditionally involved in transportation planning. Um, so I just wanted to say that since there was some discussion at AMBAG um, and, and thank you for the presentation here. Great, thank you, Commissioner Brown. Thank you, um, Ms. Munz. We'll now uh, go back to the update on Highway 1. This is Item 24. Sure, and sure, Koenig, if I could interrupt. Sure. Um, we have uh, guests here for, um, to do a presentation, and we're, since we're running a little late, I was wondering if uh, you wouldn't mind if the, the County Public Health Department sure. got to do the presentation. Item 26. Yes. That's um, fine with me, unless anyone has any objections. All right, sure, then we will proceed with item 26 and receive a presentation from County Health Service, Services Agency Public Health Division on safe and active transportation programs. And for a presentation on this, we have Arnold Schur and Teresa Rogerson from Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency. Good morning, commissioners Good morning. and staff. Um, my name is Teresa Rogerson, and um, I'm a senior health educator with the county uh, public health. Hello to some of you that I know already and to others that I don't. Um, let me get my computer up here. Um, Arnold and I are here this morning to um, present to you some of the programs that we um, work on in uh, County uh, Health Services Agency for the Public Health Division. Um, and I oversee the safe and active transportation programs. And uh, Arnold and I work closely together on those programs along with a couple of other team members. Um, so we wanted to give an overview uh, for you this morning of, of all of what we do, but with a, a particular focus on the TDA funded programs at Transportation Development Act funding that uh, you've committed to us um, every year for uh, specifically two uh, uh, programs, the Community Traffic Safety Coalition and our Ride and Stride uh, Education Program in the schools. So um, I'm going to um, hand it over to Arnold to introduce himself and get started with telling you a little bit more about CTSC. Oh, oh this way, sorry. <laughs> Great, sure. Yeah, thank you. So hi everybody, my name is Arnold Schur. I'm a health educator here with, the, with the County Public Health and thank you for allowing us to speak and present on the presentation. So if you could move to the next slide, please. There we go, perfect. So we just wanted to give you all a, a quick and brief overview. So the Community Traffic Safety Coalition is the umbrella that covers all of the programming that we conduct throughout the county. Uh, what the CTSC is, it's a countywide coalition staffed by County Public Health. Which button is it? Perfect, thank you, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so the Community Traffic Co uh, Safety Coalition is a countywide uh, coalition staffed by us at County Public Health and has members of various uh, public works departments uh, attend, city planning, law enforcement, community members, nonprofit, uh, nonprofit organiza organization staff, and many other stakeholders from multiple jurisdictions throughout the county that meet with us on a bi-monthly basis. Our mission is to uh, pre prevent traffic related injuries and fatalities for all road users with a specific focus on those cycling and walking through a Vision Zero lens. We support all, of, all jurisdictions in passing Vision Zero policies to achieve a goal of zero traffic fatalities and, and serious injuries. And arrow. Yeah, um, point it forward. Just next slide, I'm so sorry, the, the remote's just not working for me, my apologies for that. Um, we're, we're more used to the uh, online meetings now, so 
<laughs> thank you, thank you for bearing with us. Uh, we wanted to give you all just a quick and brief overview as well of the Vision Zero uh, policy and the safe systems approach. So Vision Zero, for, uh, for people who aren't familiar, is an international policy that aims to eliminate all fatal and serious injury cra uh, traffic crashes. Vision Zero, um, in the past few years, has moved towards utilizing a safe system approach, um, which evaluates our, road safety, uh, our roadway safety from a systems level perspective. Vision Zero really focuses on improving safety through an equity lens for all road users at all levels of our transportation system, and especially those who are the most vulnerable uh, road users, so cyclists and pedestrians. Vision Zero is the goal, and the safe systems approach is the vehicle that gets us there. The uh, safe systems approach, if you uh, take a look at the slides on the right, uh, on the outer ring, it has uh, six principles, which are death and serious injury are unacceptable, humans will make mistakes, humans are vulnerable, responsibility is shared, safety is proactive, and redundancy is crucial. Uh, with those six principles, we aim, to, uh, we aim for the five objectives that are on the inner spokes. So that would be safer road users, safer vehicles, safer speeds, safer roads, and post-crash care. And uh, the safe systems approach in Vision Zero really aims to bring together stakeholders from various uh, realms to work at a systems level and move past the individual blame that we really see uh, occurring on our roadway system and focusing on a system level. So they evaluate the responsibility of all of the stakeholders um, and, and all the responsibility that we share when uh, death and serious injury occur. And next slide, please. Okay, so the Vision Zero work plan objectives are provided for you here. So uh, currently we have four, uh, four objectives, which are to continue to assist the city of Watsonville in Vision Zero action plan implementation, assist the city of Santa Cruz in developing a Vision Zero task force and action plan, promote Vision Zero adoption and implementation in all other jurisdictions, and develop and maintain countywide Vision Zero collaboration and support. So we work on a two-year work plan, um, and we are currently in the second year of our current work plan. Next slide, please. Thank you. As Ardell mentioned, um, we, um, we briefly uh, touched on some of the jurisdictions in the last slide, and uh, Watsonville was our first Vision Zero city um, due to a high number of pedestrian fatalities. Um, mostly in uh, 2017, there seemed to be a spike, which led to uh, city council adopting the Vision Zero policy in 2018 there. Um, and soon after, they formed a Watsonville Vision Zero Task Force um, in 2020. And uh, that uh, came out of uh, what was a subcommittee of the CTSC that had been meeting down there for quite a number of years. Uh, they adopted their Vision Zero Action Plan in 2021. And uh, this plan acknowledges that traffic deaths and serious injuries are preventable with a goal of eliminating them by 2030. The city of Santa Cruz was next in becoming a Vision Zero city within uh, our county, and they adopted their policy in August of 2019. CTSE staff are actively working with community advocates and the city of Santa Cruz public work staff, as well as others at the city um, on Vision Zero efforts, and we are encouraging them to develop a task force and a standalone Vision Zero action plan for their city. Passing it back over to Arnold. Next slide, please. Awesome, thank you, Teresa. So uh, moving a little bit forward. So over the last year, uh, we worked with a few different jurisdictions here within Santa Cruz County on an opportunity called the Safe Streets and Roads for All Opportunity. So this is a, grant, a federal grant opportunity that was associated with the bipartisan infrastructure law. So we worked with, uh, our public health staff worked with the County Community Development and Infrastructure Department and the cities of Scotts Valley and cities of Watsonville to apply successfully for, a, uh, for the first round of funding. We were awarded just under $688,000 in federal funding for the County of Scotts uh, County uh, CDI, City of Scotts Valley to develop new Vision Zero Action Plans and for the city of Watsonville to update their, own, uh, their current Vision Zero Action Plan to make it up to par with what the federal government is uh, aiming for. Um, CTSC staff will be actively working with each of the uh, jurisdictions to provide a public health perspective into the Vision Zero work and assist with the development of task forces and action plans in each of those cities. 
currently within the county, four out of the five jurisdictions have now passed vision zero policies. And we've also spoken with uh, the city of Capitola, who is the last jurisdiction that we're working with on, um, on passing a vision zero policy. But when we spoke to them um, in the past, they mentioned that there were a bit of staffing barriers. So we'll be continuing to work with them moving forward. Thank you. So the other program that is uh, funded by TDA through the RTC is our Ride and Stride. Uh, and this program uh, offers bilingual interactive classroom presentations on bicycle and pedestrian safety to all elementary schools throughout the county um, for grades TK through uh, fifth and sixth grade. Uh, topics that are oftentimes covered in these presentations are helmet use, traffic rules, and safe street crossing. Uh, the photo that you see here is a collaboration with Ecology Action uh, to do a walking field trip with students after they received a classroom presentation. For this fiscal year, a total of 16 schools were served through this program uh, and the TDA funding in addition to other funding sources, um, reaching 1,472 students uh, with 61 classroom presentations. This is a bit under what we usually reach in a year uh, due to staff vacancies and some of the winter school closures due to flooding this past year. Next slide, please. Um, our CTSC and Ride and Stride staff hours work well beyond the TDA objectives to many other bike and pedestrian safety activities, such as distributing reflective bike safety items and bike light sets to community members in need, uh, doing bike and a uh, bike helmet fitting and distribution throughout the county, uh, conducting group walks and bike rides, traffic safety presentations and outreach events, uh, coordinating our Bicycle Traffic School, which is a diversion program for those who've received a citation on their bicycle. Um, we also offer this program to the public for free. Uh, and then in addition to that, safe routes to school and complete street planning efforts. Next slide, please. We also coordinate a child passenger safety program for the county. Uh, our team uh, usually has one to two certified car seat technicians that work one-on-one -on -one with families uh, for car seat inspection appointments. And uh, for low-income families, we also provide car seats through some of our funding. Um, we do trainings for uh, social workers, healthcare staff, teachers, and parents. Um, uh, those folks that, that transport children either through uh, their job or in their families. Um, we also work with partner organizations um, to identify families in need um, and best support those families to get the safety items um, necessary to uh, transport their children safely. And we're currently partnering with uh, Santa Cruz Community uh, Health Centers to assist them in getting their own car seat program kickstarted for their prenatal patients. Next slide, please. So moving forward, um, we help secure grant funding for local uh, non-infrastructure transportation programming focused on safety as we've reviewed today. Um, and uh, our idea for the future is to, uh, to basically bring everything under that Vision Zero umbrella um, through our Community Traffic Safety Coalition. Ride and Stride, as we mentioned, Bicycle Traffic School, Child Passenger Safety, Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Efforts, as well as Neighborhood Traffic Calming. Um, so in addition to the TDA funding through your commission, um, we've been successful in uh, being awarded competitive grants through uh, the State Office of Traffic Safety, the Active Transportation Program, and other sources. Um, and we wanna thank you for providing the foundation for continuing to do the public health work of preventing death and serious injury on our local roads. Next slide. So we just wanted to um, close with um, offering you an opportunity to ask us any questions and um, we'll try to provide the information to you if we have it now or get it to you um, if we don't. Um, and I also wanted to just, uh, on the next slide, if you wouldn't mind pulling that up for just a second, um, thank uh, everyone that's on our team currently. We do 
have some staffing shortages. And uh, I must say that Arnold, this will be the first and last time that you see him because Santa Clara is getting him from us. Um, we have been losing people, <laughs> um, unfortunately, because it's a very expensive place to live. And um, so we wish Arnold the best in his um, new work in Santa Clara County and thank him for being here today. Um, and then, yeah, we can go back to the question slide. So, so I want to offer you an opportunity to ask any questions. Thank you both. Uh, other comments or questions from commissioners? Uh, no, Commissioner Johnson, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Safety for particularly our young people is so important. I do want to discuss a couple of topics, namely e-bikes and scooters. Um, I was to get away from the heat a couple of weeks ago, I was fortunate enough to go to Abbott Square mm -hmm. and it was a great experience on a Friday night. However, um, there were five 15, 16 year old kids on these e-bikes with kind of the big tires just flying around, right? Uh, breaking all sorts of uh, traffic rules and so forth. So to me, it seems like there is a need to really, really concentrate on um, uh, providing education for those people, especially young people that use e-bikes. Um, none, of, none of the young uh, riders were wearing helmets. Um, you know, it was just one of those things. They're so fun to ride, right? But they're a lot like scooters. Um, the other thing is, as, as speaking of scooters, where, where you sometimes have, and even in Scotts Valley, I see eight, 10, you know, 12, 12 year olds flying around on these scooters. Um, sorry, my e watch is uh, ringing. Um, and there's, they're, you know, they're, not accompanied by any adults. Uh, they're breaking all sorts of rules as well. So I'm just wondering if there is a specific program that would kind of address uh, scooters and e-bikes that uh, kind of are not really being ignored, but uh, you know, probably need a little bit more attention. Yeah, sure, no problem. So we do have, we do offer things. So uh, as Teresa was mentioning earlier, one of the, the programs that we offer is the Bicycle Traffic School. So while that uh, while entitled that focuses on uh, bicycles, we we also um, offer that class for free to community members. And th what that really works on is it teaches uh, community members uh, about the laws associated with biking or riding uh, riding a wheeled mobi uh, wheeled mobility device here in the county. Uh, we also, through the CTSC, uh, discussed the same concern about micromobility devices and specifically e-bikes and the concerns that folks had regarding like speeds and and um, uh, speeds and unsafe behaviors and specifically by younger individuals as well too. So we conducted some research onto that and what we're what we're aiming to do is to develop an informational sheet to hand out information uh, with educational resources that are available, such as our uh, bicycle traffic school that uh, community members could take um, for, uh, to, to help educate. And also we have the ride and stride courses, which help to uh, teach to that specifically in some of the elementary school classes, which Teresa could talk about as well too. Yeah, if any of you would like to be on the subcommittee that's talking about e-bike uh, and micro-mobility safety, we would love to have you join us. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks, yeah, I'll, I'll add that's definitely the number one concern I'm hearing from the community as well is mm -hmm. teenagers riding with e-bikes the wrong direction on the sidewalk without helmets. Um, so hopefully some of those informational pamphlets that you uh, develop will um, maybe include a list of potential fines that they could face. I know that um, CHP, when I asked them about it, said that they do have uh, increased funding for um, you know, more cracking down on this issue. Um, so I think uh, you know, we've got to approach it from, from both sides, the educational side as well as the uh, consequences side. Um, but you know, hopefully you can incorporate that into the information that you distribute. Yeah, and we're also um, uh, distributing helmets and lights, so hopefully that'll help as well. Okay. Is there another comment or question over here? All right, seeing none, does any member of the public wish to comment on the presentation? Yeah. Seeing no one here in chambers, is there anyone online? 
We do have some speakers. We'll start off with Mr. Ben Vernassa. Mr. Vernassa? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. We can. Okay. Uh, very briefly, uh, we have this new, pro new program for vouchers. In 2001, I, I took the, the RTC up and got a voucher, but I had to go to three hours safety class. Now, here's a perfect match between Arnold and the RTC. These vouchers should require a safety class. Now, if, if the rider is going to be under 16, I suggest a parent come with the, the younger child. That's my suggestion. I think it's workable. And I really appreciate the County Health Services Agency and what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vanessa. Yeah, I'm wondering if he might be talking about the incentive programs that exist for purchasing e-bikes. Um, there have been a number of those throughout the years, uh, dating back quite a ways, but I know there are some current ones as well. And um, yeah, that could be something that is added to that, I suppose, as a requirement to do a, a safety class. That has been done in the past by Ecology Action, for sure. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Ms. Lonnie Faulkner. Hi, thank you so much. I really want to appreciate Teresa and Arnold for the work they've done. It's been a pleasure working with them, with the Community Traffic Safety Coalition. And I know we've had these conversations many times and uh, working on both education and consequences. Just want to remind us to look further at infrastructure for traffic calming. I think this is really essential. Um, we can see this uptick of e-bikes on the streets and kids because it is the new popular thing and it's a fun way to give kids independence. But what a lot of people may not see is the um, aggressiveness and speeding issues that are um, done by drivers that are in the 6,000, 10,000 pound vehicles. I know that we're trying to move away from uh, focusing on the individual and moving towards infrastructure and I think that's really key because especially now when we're seeing these huge trucks with F-150s and really giant sized trucks a lot of bicyclists and pedestrians are in danger of getting hit by these giant sized trucks and we know that speed or lowering speeds to about 30 kilometers per hour directly translates to safe um, passage for our pedestrians and cyclists on the roads. And with that, I just want to um, echo that a lot of families I've talked to, a lot of parents are really upset that their kids can't bike to school anymore. It's just not safe for them. And so again, I want to appreciate Teresia and Arnold for the work they do to help Vision Zero be implemented in our streets. It's so important to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Yeah, I appreciate the comments about infrastructure, and uh, I, I will mention that our county was very successful in um, receiving a number of awards through the state active transportation program cycle six, uh, including one that we received at the health services agency where we'll be uh, going into 12 different school communities in Watsonville uh, to do uh, non-infrastructure programming as well as uh, temporary pop-up infrastructure projects and uh, building traffic gardens for folks to practice um, cy safe cycling and walking um, without being on the street <laughs> until they're ready to do that. Thank you. Mr. Jonathan Gorin. Uh, good morning, Commission. My name is Jonathan Gorin. I live in Santa Cruz. Um, I just want to talk about Vision Zero a little bit, and I feel that while well, there's been progress, there hasn't been enough. When I bike to school, I feel like I'm going to get killed every single time. It's very scary because um, that's traffic going 35 miles an hour on a little strip. But then what separates me is a little piece of uh, paint that cars can just go over. And I heard a commissioner talking about how these teenagers are um, riding around like crazy. And I agree that I think it's unsafe that they're, um, that they're not wearing helmets, but the same thing can be said about car drivers. Why isn't the commission doing anything more 
When I walk around downtown, I see car drivers rolling through stop signs, rolling through red lights. How come the commission isn't addressing that? Why is bikes the target? When historically, as the previous speaker mentioned, that tens of thousands of fatalities because of cars, while the bike and pedestrian fatalities are much, much, much less than non-existent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Uh, well, I was just going to say, I would encourage um, Mr. Gordon to just, uh, we would love to have more youth involved in our uh, traffic safety efforts and um, feel free to reach out to us uh, to become, um, you know, a member of the Community Traffic Safety Coalition, if you wish. Mr. David Van Brink. Uh, hello, can you hear me okay? We can. Hi, so um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. This is obviously super important stuff. Um, E-bikes, kids on e-bikes, it's, it's totally a thing. It's, it's a good thing, they're not cars and that's good. So the thing about motor vehicles is that they really do facilitate the possibility of rude behavior. When you operate any motor vehicle, it literally takes effort not to be a jerk. So on the plus side, you know, these, these kids will hopefully be slightly more tuned into non-car road users when they start barreling around in SUVs and whatnot. Um, I like to bring this suggestion to encourage safety training for new users. Uh, and uh, the whole Vision Zero system approach, that's just super important stuff, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Brink. We do not have any more speakers. All right, well, this is a non-action item, so unless there's any more comments. Uh, yeah, sure, Commissioner Hernandez. You know, I want to thank Teresa and Amir for all their work they've been doing with uh, with the with the programming and, and also with uh, Vision Zero throughout the county, but especially in Watsonville, of course. You know, we've always had a, a, a an issue with uh, traffic and pedestrian uh, collisions, and so we wanted to address that uh, since I think probably 2014, 15, and. I think that we made good good progress since then. And I think that as a county too, we have to address it countywide in a lot of our rural roads and creating the infrastructure in a lot of our rural roads as well because there's a lot of folks that, and I'm starting to see more and more young people actually riding their bikes out in the, out in the rural areas. A lot of Latino uh, uh, youth also riding their bikes and the, the big wheel bikes as well out in, in South County too. So it's something that we're gonna uh, eventually really have to focus in on. So thank you for all your work and commitment to Vision Zero. Thank you for your support over the years. All right, if there's no other comments, thank you, uh, Mr. Schur and Ms. Rogerson very much for the presentation today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right, we will now proceed with item 24, the Highway 1 construction update, oral report by Senior Transportation Engineer, Sarah Christensen. Thank you, Chair. So um, I think we've all experienced the construction out there. It's been really busy uh, over the summer. And um, I'm here to give you a little glimpse of what's going on behind the K-Rail. And just for reference, the K-Rail is the temporary uh, construction railings that are protecting the workers from the live traffic. So um, next slide. So we have um, the first project under construction now. That's the one that you see out there now, uh, 41st to SoCal, which includes the Chanticleer bicycle pedestrian overcrossing. But we are about to start construction on the phase two project, which uh, goes from Bay Porter Interchange, um, an additional three miles south to State Park Drive. And that project was awarded um, earlier this year and um, the contractor's on board and they're getting ready to break ground in the next couple months here. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I also wanted to touch on our public outreach plan. Um, we want to give regular updates to the commission on uh, construction of the project, but we're also very busy behind the scenes um, putting out information. And so we just wanted to touch on that and how we're um, doing more focused outreach in South County, as well as coordinating with other major projects in our region. Um, and then I'll be available for questions and any kind of discussion. Next slide. 
Okay. So this is a, this is really exciting for me. I don't know. <laughs> Retaining wall number two is a soldier pile type of wall that is along the northbound side of the highway. These are steel piles that are vertically drilled down um, into the embankment. Uh, this wall is located adjacent to Rodeo Gulch, so you could see the drone footage on the right side um, showing uh, Rodeo Gulch and kind of the vegetated area and then this retaining wall uh, that's being built. Uh, the next step is um, lagging is going to be installed. So those are the horizontal pieces that are kind of um, in between the piles that are installed and those um, will start uh, being installed today actually. Um, here's a couple other shots. It's a large structure um, and a lot of grading involved. So um, pretty heavy equipment right up against that K rail. Um, on the right side, you can see the drill rig uh, for the soldier piles, and that's how they um, kind of dig the hole in for the vertical pile. Yeah, next. This is another retaining wall. It's a, a reinforced concrete uh, standard type of wall, uh, number four. It's also on the northbound side, and uh, here are just a couple photos of the formwork, which is the kind of carpentry type of uh, building of the, the forms, and then they pour the concrete. Um, and then once the concrete is cured uh, enough, they break the forms off. So you could kind of see from left to right the progress of how that um, wall is being constructed. And then the next step is going to be to backfill um, for future northbound lanes. The pedestrian overcrossing is a major um, element of the project. This is a rendering showing what uh, the bridge will look like once it's done. And you can see the aesthetic features we have up there, which are the humpback whales that the community chose when we did outreach back in 2019. Uh, and next slide. So this bridge has several, you saw several columns and each of those columns needs a foundation. So what they're building right now is a foundation. Um, you've probably seen this very tall um, drill rig out uh, in the median of the highway as well as on either side of the highway. Uh, there are eight vents that they are drilling the piles for and this bridge is gonna be um, happening over time. Uh, once the foundations are done, they're working their way up. So. Um, it's pretty exciting to see. Here's a couple other shots of the median. Um, it's bent five, just for reference. Uh, big um, reinforcement cages going into the, uh, the casing underground. And this is a major drainage system, also <coughs> on the northbound side. Um, just for reference on the left side, you could see those are two people down there. <laughs> uh, so that's a, that, those are some big pipelines that are coming into the state right of way and we're building a structure to make it a continuous system all the way through. So um, this is a major, I think the biggest drainage structure on the project. So they've been um, building the farm <coughs> and then um, putting in the reinforcement and pouring the concrete, next slide. So this is kind of a progression. And then in the bottom right, you could see uh, after they pop the forms off, that's what it looks like. Um, so just a reminder of the schedule of the phase one project. So Cal the 41st, we started earlier this year and construction's gonna go through um, probably the end of 2025, uh, pending uh, weather conditions. <coughs> And then I mentioned the phase two project uh, construction is about to start and it's gonna go into 2026. So uh, stay tuned for more. We have prepared a project specific public outreach plan for this project because it is a major regional project. Um, the public outreach plan um, includes um, press releases <coughs> both by Caltrans and the RTC. Uh, we actually, um, translate the uh, press releases in-house and um, so that all of our Spanish speaking community can also receive the information. We also have a very robust social media presence and put information out that way. Um, E-news uh, and even radio. Uh, so you could see uh, we're on you know all the social medias 
Twitter and Facebook and um, just some examples of what we're doing here. Uh, we try to do the news releases weekly, even if we don't have any major closures or anything, but um, obviously ramping up our uh, press releases and our outreach when there will be a closure anticipated, like um, overnight a couple weeks ago, they were removing a couple overhead signs. Uh, so we really ramped up on that. Next slide. So we're also aware um, of a, a lot of other major projects that are um, about to go to construction or are, start, are under construction. So uh, mainly County of Santa Cruz is about to start construction on the Soquel Drive multimodal um, project, which is the buffered and protected bike lanes, 22 signals, 100 curb ramps. Um, that's about to start construction and we are coordinating with the County Public Works folks um, and their construction um, closures will be during the day and they are planning to go uh, SoCal Drive as a four lane facility. So they're planning to do in one direction at a time, closing one lane during the day between the window of 8.30 and 4.30. And so we're working with them, um, reviewing the schedules and making sure that we're coordinating. Um, luckily the Highway 1 closures, if we're doing any closures, which we haven't been recently, um, we only close lanes at night. So there's no you know, closures happening at the same time there. However, our city of Santa Cruz is soon advertising the Murray Street Bridge project. Um, and that project will overlap a few months with the SoCal Drive multimodal project. So we're working together to um, make sure that uh, maybe we could get the SoCal Drive multimodal north end of the project built first so that um, it kind of evens it out and doesn't have um, sequential closures happening. Um, and then there's other regional projects that are on the horizon, um, including City of Watsonville's Hark and Slope Bicycle and Pedestrian Overcrossing, which um, I believe is going to go uh, to bid next year, like in the spring or summer time frame. So we are considering lane and shoulder closure timing. We're co coordinating quite a bit. Um, we are planning uh, weekly co consolidated updates for regional projects to get the word out as best as we can. Um, and the next slide. We have a few tools that we use. Um, the Cruise 511 actually has GIS layers um, already loaded in it that automatically get updated. Uh, there's highway lane closures, which are the cones, um, if you could see that. But I, I encourage you to go to cruise511.org and see those two yellow arrows on the bottom left. Um, make sure you click those uh, on and then you could see all of the um, various activities happening. Um, so these are the Caltrans layers and the county layers uh, that both agencies update regularly and those automatically get updated in Cruise 511. So we feel that that's going to be a really good tool to kind of get a holistic picture of what's going on. Um, and we're also right now working on getting the city's layer uploaded into our system so that city of Santa Cruz will have um, that layer in there and working with other uh, cities to try to get whatever information is available. Um, the other kind of cool thing that I wanted to put out there was that Caltrans has a CCTV map um, whole network across the whole state. But there's a couple cameras along Highway 1, one of which is already installed and pointed toward construction. So you could see on the right side of the screen, um, it, you could see the Rodeo Gulch um, area and the um, soldier pile wall that's being constructed. So um, if you just search in your browser for Caltrans CCTV map and then zoom in to the project area, you could watch it live, construction happening right before your eyes. Another cool thing I wanted to mention is they are working on installing another CCTV camera that will be pointed um, in the southbound direction that will be pointed at the bridge construction. So we plan to have a time-lapse video made hopefully at the end of the project to show like the progression and then we can all um, see how it was built in you know one minute or something even though it's going to take about two years so um, so those are a couple things we're working on next slide and that concludes my presentation so here for questions thank you Ms. Christensen I see a question from Commissioner Rockin 
Could you comment on the timing for the um, bus on shoulder underpass at, at Soquel Avenue, for example? Um, is that being done simultaneously and will buses go under there before we get to the next thing or is it we're doing everything first and then the buses come back later? <clears throat> How's that being structured? I'm not sure I understand, but the, the bus on shoulder element of the project is it's part of the construction. So um, once the project's completed, then the bus on shoulder will be operational. We'll be working with Metro on, um, there's a couple things that need to happen, mainly a public uh, outreach campaign sure. specifically for bus on shoulder, training of all the operators on how to use the bus on shoulder facility. So that will all be in the works um, soon. Yeah, but so as they finish, for example, Soquel Bridge, it won't be waiting until 41st is done to be able to have the bus go under Soquel. At least in it's the probably concept. not going to have like little incremental. Um, it's probably just going to be, you know, operational all at once and not okay. in phases. I, if, you can, if you can do a little research and let me know what the sort of plan is there, I'd like to know. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rocky. Commissioner Quinn. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, somewhat guiltily uh, share your fascination with the construction. Uh, I do have a question, though. I think predictably, SoCal is really jammed up around the hospital and Sutter getting through there. And so I want to loop back on something you mentioned months ago. Any progress on getting the lights synchronized on SoCal to try to speed traffic along? Anything we can do about that three-way stop at Robertson that literally can take 10 to 20 minutes to get through southbound? And then in terms of the lane closures on SoCal, will the uh, lane priority be uh, northbound in the morning and southbound in the afternoon? Will, will you be able to switch that third lane to try to mitigate traffic congestion? Okay, um, let me start with your first question about sinking the lights. So the, the multimodal project is upgrading 22 signals and they will be synced. Great. So it will take about a year but they'll be synced um, by the end of the construction of the project. Robertson, um, I don't have much of an update on that. And I know last time you, <laughs> uh, Chair, Mon uh, Chair Koenig had um, quite a bit of information, but um, I can check with the County Public Works if um, to see how that is being staged specifically that area. I know between 41st and Robertson, it's really bad. My, uh, my understanding is they're completing the planning work for that right now, uh, but I've not yet identified funds for construction. Stoplights can be stubbornly expensive uh, in the neighborhood of a million dollars. So um, I think right now the hope is that maybe some uh, development project in the area could help pay for it. <coughs> but I don't think it's going to be done any, there's, there's almost no chance it'll be done before this SoCal Drive project uh, gets underway. Yeah. And then finally, the closures, um, the way that the county wrote their contract is they, um, they allow the windows and they didn't specify direction, but it's 8.30 to 4.30 and it's one direction at a time. So they won't have, they won't go down to one lane um, in the same location. <laughs> Um, it's essentially at each intersection where they're building the ADA ramps is when they need to go down to one lane. Um, so they envision, um, you know, one direction, completing it, and then going to the other direction, if that makes sense. No, I get that, but is it, is it possible that the side with two lanes can be directionally coordinated with the time of day? I could check with the county. I don't think their contract specifically um, covered that or had that arrangement. I think it's just a full daytime window, unfortunately. So, but I could check. You could always. Ask. I think it'd be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn. Other questions or comments? All right. Seeing none, is there any member of the public that wishes to comment on the update? Seeing no one here in chambers, is there anyone online? We do not have any hands raised. Okay. This is a non-action item. Thank you, Senior Engineer Christensen, for the report. Our part is lots of action. <laughs>
Well, yes, that's, uh, the, the action already happened as far as the voting on this project. Hey, can I say one more sure, thing? Sorry, the, um, safety is really um, the utmost importance and just a reminder to abide by all of the speed um, restrictions and know that the, the workers have families to go home to and um, just uh, be cautious out there. And thank you for your attention. Great, thank you. All right, now we'll proceed with item 27, Transit and Intercity Rail Capital Program or TERSIP Grant Funding Master Agreement, Contract Award for Professional Engineering and Environmental Services, and amendment to the Measure D Rail Category five-year program of projects for the zero emission passenger rail and trail project between Pajaro Junction and, the Santa, Cruz, and Santa Cruz along the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. And for an update on this, we have Transportation Engineer Riley Jabrant. Thank you, Chair Coney, and good morning, Commissioner. My name is Riley Gerbrand. I am honored as Associate Transportation Engineer to be part of your staff. I joined the RTC on the engineering team in 2021 and have been working on capital projects along the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. I'll be serving as project manager for the Zero Emission Passenger Rail and Trail Project. And before you here today regarding item number 27 on today's agenda, to request that the Commission authorize Signing the master agreement to administer grant funding for the transit and intercity rail capital program, yeah. referred to as TERSIP. Signing master agreements and other agreements with the state or federal agencies to receive and administer regional, state, and federal funds. Thirdly, signing the professional engineering and environmental services contract not to exceed $7,703,548 with HCR Engineering Incorporated to complete the full project concept report for the zero emission passenger rail and trail project between Pajaro Junction and Santa Cruz along the Santa Cruz branch rail line. Fourthly, to amend the Measure D rail category program of project to add 1.63 million of funding over the next two years to fully fund the project concept report, to amend the RTC budget accordingly, and lastly, to authorize inter-program loans from other Measure D fund categories manage cash flow if needed. In December 2022, the Commission authorized a contract with HGR Engineering in the amount of $3 million to partially fund the completion of the project concept report for the zero emission passenger rail and trail project. Since that time, the RPC has secured additional funds for the project. In April of this year, the state announced a Church of Cycle 6 grant award at $3.45 million to the RTC for the project concept report. Staff recommends that the Commission award the Professional Engineering and Environmental Services contract to fund the project concept report. To receive and administer the TERSIP funds, TERSIP guidelines require that the RTC enter into a master agreement, a program supplement agreement, and other agreements with the state. The master agreement will enable the RTC through program supplement to receive Cycle 6 TERSIP funds as well as future terms of funds. With the awarded $3.45 million of ter in terms of cycle six competitive funding and the previous program, $3.8 million of Measure D rail and $350,000 of Measure D trail fund and an additional $1.63 million of Measure D rail category fund is needed to fully fund the project concept report over the next two years. The RTC could choose to program for future terms of formula funds or other discretionary funds for item 28 in the agenda today to fund the project concept report or subsequent phases of the project. This concludes my staff report. The staff team is available if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerbrandt. Are there comments or questions from commissioners? I see uh, Commissioner Johnson. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for that report. Um, I guess you know, it seems to me that seven whatever million dollars is a lot of money. Why is another $1.63 million needed when you have all these grants coming from the feds and the state? Right. The, um, when the TERSIP um, cycle six awards came out, um, we were awarded only part of what we requested from the uh, TERSIP program. The, uh, the program awarded us $3.45 million dollars um, for the project concept report um, that did not fully fund um, the, uh, the amount of money required to complete the project concept report. Um, 
so we need to supplement with what we've already programmed, um, plus the brand work to complete uh, that project comps report. Well, is the scope of the project, um, sometimes when the scope of the project exceeds funds, sometimes you uh, monitor it and then reduce the scope of the project. Was that ever a consideration? So back in, it was a consideration. So back in December of last year, um, when the commission uh, awarded the three point, the three million dollar contract, that was after the RTC had gone through negotiations with the, um, the best proposal at that time, HR engineering, for the project concept report. Initially, um, the, the, the proposal came in um, for more than we could fund at that time. So through negotiations, we were able to reach an agreement uh, to keep us going. Um, since that time, we've, as I mentioned before, received the terms of over grant work. We've also been in negotiations with HDR Engineering to um, develop a scope of work that would um, complete what is necessary for the project concept report um, and also to uh, you know, address some of the um, uh, concerns that have been raised through things um, like climate change, um, environmental concerns. We're, we're actually bringing some of the um, some early engineering into that project concept report to make sure that when we develop the, the concept, it is something that we can move through all the way through the environmental document. So we have done a lot of work and ICR Engineering has really been uh, part of the team in this to develop a scope that both of us feel completes what we need to. Um, but in the end of the day, uh, we do have a shortfall that um, we need to um, address. Uh, and right now we're requesting that the uh, $1.63 million be programmed um, for the next two years. So is the $1.63 million essentially taking from the future bug bucket of funds that will be coming to the RTC through Measure D? Yes, there's two things that occurred. One, um, because we've been in negotiations for a length of time, um, we didn't start the project as uh, originally intended earlier this year. So we are going to be starting the project in this current fiscal year. Um, which allows us to has allowed us to program or allowed us to program some funds that um, weren't originally available because they pushed things down the road. Um, and secondly, yes, so we would be programming some of the future funds over the next two years from that Measure D bucket to fund the uh, the remainder of the project on support. Will rating that money have an adverse effect on our future plans for? what those dollars were intended for, for our future concerns? No, no, at the moment um, with our current program, we feel that we have capacity to uh, complete everything that's on our um, priority list of projects and concerns. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I am gonna support this item because I believe it's the only way we can get to the correct answers regarding uh, the costs and other challenges associated with uh, building and operating our uh, passenger rail system as envisioned. And I understand we need enough design and environmental uh, review to fully grasp the wide spectrum of these challenges. And it's the only way we can really get a truly informed posi uh, position uh, on this uh, for, to make that decision. I appreciate the staff continuing uh, to seek outside funding for this endeavor, and I'll continue to support future development efforts to leverage um, Measure D rail and trail funds because uh, we must get to an accurate understanding of the feasibility. Um, but that said, what, and this was uh, Mr. Johnson, Commissioner Johnson alluded to, what I will not support is diverting uh, local funding to proceed with passenger rail at the expense of other critical transportation projects. Um, that kind of decision cannot be justified until we really uh, have a very clear understanding of the cost to build and operate the service and frankly, whether it is even logistically feasible to do so in the coastal zone. Um, 
The coastal zone feasibility is but one of the numerous potential obstacles, uh, some of which could end uh, uh, being project killers, in fact. And uh, we need to know what we're getting into. We need to care about the cost to build and operate the service. We need to know the full cost and benefit to the community compared to other transportation projects. And I think it's important to note that these are rail category funds that are going to be used. Uh, so I'm going to be supporting this. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Schifrin? Yes, a couple of questions. Um, it wasn't totally clear to me whether the um, project concept report included the environmental document. Is that part of what will be produced as a result of the funding that's being proposed here? It is not. No, the, um, the, full, the project environmental document would come in the subsequent tax. Okay, so that's not... So what we're going to get is, could you talk a little bit more about what a project concept report is going to tell us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the project concept report, um, in a nutshell, will deliver us with a project definition that is stable and able to be brought through the environmental document space. So it looks at all of the um, existing information we have. It looks, like, it looks at the corridor. Um, it takes in uh, initial engineering work and some initial environmental um, analysis work to develop a, um, a, a project that will be able to be um, actually you know, completed and gone through the environmental, environmental document. So it brings all of that together, that synthesizes it and gives us something that we can move forward with. Okay, thank you. The other question I have is, I guess, I'm not sure it's to you or to other staff, has to do with whether some of the uh, STIP or uh, um, RTIP funding that is alluded to in the staff report is potentially available, could be available, could be applied for without threatening other locally local priority projects. I think Commissioner McPherson's concern is a valid one. Uh, on the other hand, there is a lot of different funding sources that uh, were alluded to by staff. And I think in the director's report even talked about funding, state funding that could be for, you know, inter, inter city rail. So I'm just wondering whether it might make sense to at least uh, develop um, a possible project for consideration for the uh, con con consideration by the commission that could be funded uh, without threatening other local projects. So I'll take that question. Um, certainly, uh, this project is eligible for the, the RTIP funding, and we could uh, use RTIP funding instead of Measure D rail category funding. Um, but the issue, of course, is the prioritization of our multiple needs here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, there simply is not enough money to fund all of the projects that we're interested in funding. So the commission will have some difficult decisions to make with regards to prioritization. Um, the Measure D rail category funding is specifically um, earmarked for both rail preservation as well as rail studies, including the environmental study. The RTIP funding could be used for this. And now the third um, potential funding source is this new TERSIP formula funding that, that's available. One of the challenges we've had in programming excessive amounts of Measure D uh, rail category funding for this project is um, the strain that we've had on that account due to the multiple needs on the branch line. Uh, we've had to uh, reduce the amount of preservation activities that we plan on doing over the next few years to be able to provide this match. Uh, we also have not been uh, refunded uh, from the uh, Federal um, Emergency Management Agency or FEMA yet for the 2017 storm damage jobs. Uh, we expended $4 million on that. Um, and unless we get reimbursed for that, that will um, create a negative clash, cash flow situation for that account, which is why we're looking at potentially uh, using other funds to relieve some of the pressure off of Measure D. Um, it's good to hear the commission's um, 
uh, uh, desires to not uh, take money from one project or another, but when you have a finite amount of money available and multiple project needs, they will be competing against each other. And is that true even for the uh, rail, f the funding that's set aside for rail, the, uh, the TERSIP, whatever you call that? Well, the TERSIP funding is a little bit different in that um, that project uh, has to go to a transit project, so uh, the roadway projects won't be competing with it, but um, it would be competing with um, the needs of our transit district. So um, Metro uh, is interested in using that money for operations and other potential capital needs. Um, we could um, uh, work out an agreement with Metro where some of that money would be used for the rail project and some of that money would be uh, provided to them. That would be a future decision that the commission could consider. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Rockin. But am I correct in understanding that we're not being asked today to choose between project X, Y, Z and uh, the, the the funding gap here, that's that's an issue that still awaits us. We're saying that we're directing staff to go look for additional funding to fill that gap. And that's part one of my question. And part two is we're not prohibited from, we haven't done it yet, but bringing money forward from 8% uh, of uh, Measure D that's rail money might be another way to possibly fill that in the short term. Am I correct? So um, in answer to your first question, um, you are correct in that we're not asking for you to um, decide on using the RTIP funding um, for this project versus another project or the TERSIP funding uh, for this project versus um, providing it to Metro. Uh, we don't have, um, we haven't issued a call for projects on the RTIP project. Um, that is the next item on today's agenda. Uh, there are evaluation criteria included in that staff report, and we would have to um, apply for the funding, uh, consider the uh, um, performance measures and uh, criteria that we provided, and then make a recommendation likely um, uh, later this year um, in December, I believe, is when we target coming back to the commission to make that decision. As for the TERSIP formula funds, we still don't have the guidelines from the California State Tran uh, Transportation Agency. Uh, we need to wait for that funding and then issue a call for projects for that funding. So the only money available today is the Measure D um, uh, rail category funding. And so we ask only uh, that the commission consider using that funding to uh, um, bridge the shortfall that we currently have. Uh, with respect to, um, um, you know, the last part of your question, which was, um, um, remind bringing, me. Bringing forward uh, Measure D money. Um, oh, bringing, bringing Measure D, that is a possibility, including um, inter-program loans. Um, we will be looking at our strategic implementation plan with regards to other programming actions and likely be um, considering um, bringing uh, money forward through um, one of many uh, different financing strategy, category, strategies, including either bonding or using a new infrastructure bank that has been provided to bring money forward. We could do that for the rail category as well. Um, we're trying to, um, because of the ongoing preservation needs, uh, live within our means within that program and not bring the money forward too much. Um, but if it comes to it, that is another decision that the commission could make. So, so I'm correct in understanding that a commissioner could vote for number 27 today, but still reserve their right to say, I'm not taking money from the transit district or I'm not taking money from uh, another competitor, perhaps in the future. We're not even asking that you do that today, but in a future decision, we could come back and say, do you want to consider doing that? And then you could choose to or not to support no, that. I'm trying to be respectful of people's, like Bruce's and other people's expression about that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rock and Commissioner Hernandez. So I agree with uh, Commissioner McPherson's and, and uh, Commissioner Schifrin's concerns as well. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I agree with this, uh, with this as well, with staff's recommendation. But you know, just with the concerns as well, if we can, you know, seek for uh, and apply for alternative funding sources, not just the ones that were mentioned, but the ones that that. Uh, Mr. Preston was just mentioning as well, too, uh, that we're just, you know, just 
different, right, that you were mentioning. And I think that that's why we've got to keep you maybe as a consultant after we retire as well um, for future projects like this. But yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. And if I can respond a little bit to that too, is we are trying to figure out how to fully fund the environmental document. And Commissioner you know, Shiprin asked that question, does this fund that? And it does not. That's still a, a priority for staff based on the feedback we've received from this commission as to how to fund that. Um, we were, I was informed last week that the state plans on um, releasing a call for projects for state rail assistance funding. Um, it's one of the few funding sources that actually allow funding to be used for project development um, work, which would include an environmental document. I think our best strategy is to come up with an idea of how much we think would be reasonable to ask for and then work with the commission as to how much match do we need to put in to uh, allow us to get that. We don't want to use all of our discretionary funding on this one project if we don't need to. If there's a grant we can go after, that would be our priority and then we would want to use just the amount needed to match that grant so we can stretch the dollars as far as we possibly can. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. And it's my understanding that the, a full EIR document is pretty expensive in the 15 to $16 million range. Is that correct? I think Sarah might be better um, equipped to answer what the full additional cost would be to fund the environmental document. Um, it was with the concept report over 20 million, but the concept reports about eight. So what does that leave us with? It's still about 20 million, maybe a little more, um, but um, our full ask for a TERSIP funds uh, earlier this year was 16 million. And so we only got 3.45. Um, we're gonna continue to um, pursue the competitive grant sources that are out there, but it's just, there's very limited sources. The state rail assistance program funds that Guy mentioned is, um, is really one of the only ones that's available. Most competitive funding sources wanna fund construction. They wanna see projects built. Um, so unfortunately, you know, discretionary funds are helpful to have um, for pre-construction um, as well as the construction match. Um, but staff will continue um, refining the scope of the project. I think during the project concept report, we could find um, as we develop the project, the, the cost could change. Um, the project can change. Uh, and so we'll be bringing a lot more information to the commission through the project concept report work um, and give accurate cost estimates when they're available, so. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Uh, Commissioner Quinn. Thank you, and um, Guy, I apologize for the simplicity of this question, but if, if I look ahead in the agenda, on Measure D, the revenue is greatly exceeding the expenses. And so if uh, resources are reallocated, how does it get quote unquote paid back? Or does the rail bucket dig itself a hole it won't be able to dig out of? So we manage all of our programs via a cash flow model. Uh, we have it uh, extrapolated out until 2047, which is the last year of the measure. We bring in about 1.6 million a year in the rail category funding. So it would, um, you know, if we do need to borrow money and uh, utilize it for this project, it will impact our ability to continue to preserve the rail line. But over time, um, you know, depending on how much we actually, you know, have to use, um, we do feel that a 30 year measure provides a lot of capacity to, to pay it off. And we've looked at that pretty closely. Right now, we're not overextending ourselves past just a few years. Um, if we were to try to fully fund the EIR with only measure D, that would stretch out you know, quite, a, quite a distance further, but still we would have enough capacity. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's challenging to try to balance the various fund sources and that's why we want to try to go for grant funding if possible and possibly take a little bit of the pressure off of measure D 
um, rail category with the TERSIP formula funding that recently became available. And that will be a decision that the Commission could consider um, when we have the guidelines and, and work out something with Metro and make a recommendation. So, so doing the mental math, the, the rail fund would be borrowing four to six years out. If we receive money back from without a grant, yeah. with, without a grant, just to fund this 1.63 million, no, it wouldn't be that far out. It'd be like a year or two. Okay. If we tried to fully fund the 20 million, then you're talking four or five years out. If we don't get reimbursed from FEMA, you maybe want to add another two or three years to that. So it, it does create an impact, and we are very challenged in trying to make sure we have enough capacity to do all of the projects we want and make sure we have enough to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Quinn. Any other questions or comments? I've got a couple myself. Um, the first is on page 27-4 of our agenda. Um, it, it talks about um, the additional 1.5 million which is needed for community outreach and um, management and oversight. So is that like an internal cost simply of, of RTC staff time that um, where, where that would be realized? Yeah, so do you want to answer that, Riley? I do take it. Okay, go for it. Yeah, so um, that's a combination. Um, it will be internal RTC staff time. Um, it'll also be the community outreach expenses as well as um, there will, there will be probably some need for some project management um, consulting expenses as well. Um, yep. Okay, so the contract with HDR is 7.75 million. Um, that's what we're approving today, but uh, we can expect to have to reconcile the additional 1.5 million at some point in the future, is that? The, the request for the programming of the 1.63 million covers that. Um, okay. 1.5 million dollars. Okay, got it. Uh, and then just to, to translate uh, engineering speak into something that we can be sure that the general public can understand, um, we talked about how this report will create a project definition that can be taken through uh, the environmental planning process. So if I understand correctly, that means we'll really be looking at some of these core questions of, um, you know, where will the stations go, right? And then of course, they, uh, later we can look at the environmental impacts of those, um, where additional sightings could go, which would um, be able to yield, um, you know, more frequency of trains. And so ultimately we'll come away with, uh, from this report with an understanding of just how frequent service could be. Um, We'll look at things like you know, Beach Street, which of course is a particularly constrained area um, where you have traffic on the city streets. Uh, you've got Roaring Camp, and then of course you've got the rail line. Um, so we'll have a better understanding of how those um, elements are, impact this and you know what additional infrastructure would be needed there. Um, and of course we'd look at, I think, what kind of structures would be needed um, over places like Harkin Slough, Gallagher Slough, um, and along the Manresa Cliff. So, um, and then of course if those are even could get the necessary permits from the Coastal Commission and other state agencies. Is that a fair translation of uh, the accomplishment? Okay, I, and again, just want to make sure that the public understands. Um, you know, I'll, I'll sort of largely agree with uh, Super or Commissioner McPherson's comments. I mean, I think, you know, whether you uh, think that rail is a great idea and we should move forward with all deliberate haste, or if you are skeptical of rail, um, you know, this report is. The, it is for you. Uh, we, you need to move forward with this as the next step, I think, uh, really to try to reach consensus in our community and ultimately decide whether we're going to go all in, um, you know, pass more funding measures and try to build passenger rail um, or if we're going to change course. Um, but at the end of the day, we're going to have the best information possible once this uh, report is done. Um, so, you know, I, I'm Definitely going to support it today, and um, I think also conditional on that. Well, I, I don't need to make any additional conditions, but uh, part of the reason for that is because it is all coming from uh, rail money. It is coming from the Measure D funds, uh, specifically allocated towards rail. So I think that uh, really with both Measure Ds, we can point to uh, 
point to fulfilling the will of the voters that we're using the 8% allocated from the revenue measure uh, for rail and we are continuing to study rail uh, as you know, is really our, our best assumption of what voters want to see after the 2022 measure D. Sure, Commissioner Johnson. Didn't, didn't mean to, thank you, Chair, didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, so you mentioned, I'm hearing a lot of capital projects of, of uh, where stations might go, where uh, infrastructure, where bridges and so forth. But if you look at the smart train, you know, the capital expenditures have been pretty much settled, but it's, it's kind of like uh, Metro. Uh, the operational expenses are what kills these projects. So will this explore some of the operational challenges, namely how many employees, pensions, you know, everything associated with running a railroad, or is it just, you know, where, you know, stations are going to go? That's my question. Riley, you want me to take that one? I do, yeah. Okay, <laughs> got it. Um, so the project concept report will include cost estimates for the capital, but also we will, through defining the project, so knowing the frequency, knowing the stations, um, the sightings, where they're going and how many we need, um, that will help us estimate the operational costs as well. So we'll have, um, you know, at least preliminary operation and maintenance costs to work with um, based on the um, definition of the project. And then we will definitely need another funding source to fund the operation and maintenance of this new transit facility. There's no question about it. Do you ever do peer reviews, say, and Smart Train's a pretty good example of what their projections were, say, back in 2010 when all this was being planned and voted upon, and then what actually happened? In other words, you know, this is all going to be speculative to a certain degree, right? Correct. I mean, we're going to best guesses and, you know, uh, use all everything available to make a um, informed decision. But at the same time, you know, if you look at the bullet train, it was it was originally 33 billion. Now it's well over 100 billion. Okay, those were projections, best gets, and estimates. So, you know, there is a val validity question associated with every projection, and um, I'm, I'm hoping that that's taken into consideration. Their estimates, definitely. So, um, but. Uh, we've got a really good team. Um, we hired a really good consultant, and um, we're gonna we're gonna do our best. But you know, things like COVID happen, and uh, nobody really expected that. So. Um. So the last question, promise. Um, when you talk about public outreach, um, you know, this whole question of rail and trail and so forth has been there's been a lot of public and a lot of outreach and a lot of comment. How will it be different from reaching the, for lack of a better word, the usual suspects in terms of who people are just really committed on one side or the other? I mean, will it be outreach and how it affects your neighborhood? Uh, what, it, what, the, uh, what this will do f uh, for your particular uh, circumstance as a commuter or, or what? I'm just curious as to what is the nuts and bolts of an outreach program? So the scope of work, um, which um, if you want to, look back to the December 2023 uh, or 2022, sorry, um, agenda. There was the scope of work that had all the outreach activities, but we typically for this magnitude of a project prepare a public outreach plan specifically for the project. And we get, um, we've been getting really creative on how we reach people um, because you're right. We get a lot of people who, uh, you know, advocates for example, but we really want to reach the community members who um, may not have the luxury of be, being able to come to our meetings um, or come to other type of events and things. So um, our communication staff's uh, working with the consultant and HDR has a really solid consultant um, public outreach uh, team that is gonna be supporting us. And so we're, we're confident that we'll be able to reach as many people as, as feasible, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Rockin. Well, we, we haven't voted yet, so 
don't count on anything until it's done. But I, I want to give credit to my colleagues who are more skeptical than I am about this train. Uh, I, it was, I don't know if it was in the Good Times or somewhere, but uh, Commissioner um, Koenig made some comment. He was being questioned, you know, like about this uh, project and said at some point, well, look, I've done everything we could do to move it forward. What else would you like me to do? I'm paraphrasing, but something along those lines. And I think it, it's fair to say that that's the case with this vote. Um, there's still room for skepticism. I've said this myself. It's like at some point, maybe this thing isn't feasible, but I'm excited by its po possibility. And I just want to appreciate my colleagues who are less excited by, or maybe less excited, but less, less um, confident that it's going to be a successful project. And I think that's a responsible position to take. And I appreciate that people are willing to, let's find out what does this thing cost? Is it, where is it, you know, how many sidings will it take? How much more land do we need to purchase? Where do we have to raise the track because it's underwater in a lagoon somewhere and so forth? And finding that stuff out is critical to making a rational decision here rather than have it be based on how many letters to the editor somebody writes. So I, I want to appreciate people, again, who don't necessarily share my confidence in the project. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rockin. I appreciate that. Any other comments or questions? All right. Seeing none, I'm going to open it to pub the public. Anyone here in chambers wish to comment on this item? Good morning, uh, Chair Koenig and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Matt Farrell. I'm here today representing the Friends of the Rail and Trail. We submitted a letter enthusiastic <coughs> support of moving forward with this agreement and with the master agreement with, with Caltrans for the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program project um, or grant project. Um, I'd just like to uh, remind all of us that um, in 2012, when the CTC approved the funding for purchase of the rail, one of the commitments we made was that we would evaluate and commit to operating passenger rail on this line. I think it's really important to move forward with this evaluation process because I think we have a contractual obligation under that agreement to, you know, consistently and uh, passionately evaluate that option. Uh, secondly, I'd like to say that uh, we have had project and cost overruns in almost every capital project that's come before the commission. And we shouldn't have a separate yardstick for transit projects and uh, somehow ignore the fact that highway projects have the same problem in the climate we live in. So if we're going to be consistent about evaluating cost, there should be some metric about how much the 41st Avenue and the Freedom projects are costing compared to the original estimates because it's not really being transparent with the public about the trade-offs between these projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. All right, seeing no one else here in chambers, is there anyone <coughs> online who wishes to address the commission? Mr. Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian from Traildale. You know, I want us to step back and look at the high speed rail, which is billions of dollars worth to move from San Francisco to LA. One of the biggest flaws of that project is that they took all those billions of dollars and spent it on the local transit problems. It would be phenomenal for California, but instead they're wasting all this money on the train to nowhere that's never really going to serve Santa Cruz. Um, so you are going to have competing funds with this. It's going to take away from Metro, and we know that. And we don't need to spend $8 million to find out if the California Coastal Commission will allow 60 trains a day, a new passenger rail system along the coast, Santa Cruz Coastal. Doesn't meet the Coastal Act. It's not hard. It's not a difficult equation. So then I'm going to ask the policymakers who have um, <clears throat> residents that live next to the tracks. 
Can you imagine if somebody now is going to have 60 trains driving behind your house? Now, a lot of people will say, well, they should have never bought a tra house next to the train tracks. Well, no, they bought a house next to a freight farm that had one train going by a day. So it's essentially like if you owned a house on a, a country road, and the county came and said, we're going to build a highway through on this county road. And that's essentially what you're proposing to do. So you might like voting for this by saying, yeah, we're going to study, and we're going to study more train. You're basically telling your constituents, you're working for a train behind your backyard. And what the problem, really the ultimate problem is, is that coastal corridor has sat unused for decades now. You built 1.25 miles of the trail. You built a 12 foot wide trail that costs more than widening the highway. And you're destroying more of the trees building a 12 foot wide trail than to widen the highway. Because of your policy and your strategy, it's exactly like the high speed rail. It makes no sense. This makes no sense. Open the coastal trail and be smart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Mr. Ben Vernassa. Yes, I'll be, I'll be very short. I think that you have the cart before the horse. Simple. Get an answer from the Coastal Commission. Whether or not you can have a train. I will tell you one thing. The problem is CCA, La Selva, and Manresa, as well as others. But we're not going to allow a train come to the middle of La Selva Beach or CCA. So, uh, that's something to think about. Find out from the Coastal Commission. Simple, simple. Have a non-voting member on RTC. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vernassa. Ms. Lonnie Faulkner. Thank you so much. Um, a future with passenger rail means a future where people have a wise choice to travel throughout the county without having to get into their car. It's an equitable choice that serves our elders, people with disabilities, <coughs> and for our growing wise young population that do not want to drive. We've got a lot to learn from them. Our quiet electric rail system will connect us with Monterey, Salinas, San Jose, San Francisco, and beyond. And the um, Coastal Commission has expressed in past letters their support for passenger rail. Excessive automobile use is currently the only choice which leaves many of our community members without access to opportunities, jobs, education, <coughs> with their social network. We urge the RTC commissioners to approve this item to move quickly towards providing our community with a robust, equitable, environmentally wise alternative form of transportation that will get people out of their cars, and cars being the leading contributor to our climate crisis. We endanger our delicate coastal zone when we continually prioritize infrastructure that makes driving easier than prioritizing robust, integrated, multimodal public transit infrastructure and systems that allow a far greater percentage of our community members to walk <coughs> and bike and use transit. We hope you will ensure 30% engineering and 15 minute headways in the study our county could serve as environmental leaders in the state and nation growing a mode of transportation that reduces our extremely damaging impact on the environment. This is the promise we made to the California Transportation Commission and to our voters. And Rod Derridon goes throughout the United States expressing that rail is our future answer to our environmental crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Mr. David Van Brink. We can. Hi, uh, sorry for doubting you today. And um, a brief aside, thank you, Guy Preston, for all of your uh, work here. I miss you already. Um, in oral communications earlier, my fellow citizen Michael Saint expressed some disappointment at the progress we've made locally in implementing uh, necessary and sweeping changes in local transportation and emissions. 
Uh, I'd like to offer a partial counter counterpoint and, and appreciation. Nothing happens fast, it's true, but there are things moving forward, trail sections, metro improvements. These are real things that I directly see and use, and many of us do. So anyway, please keep all these good things moving forward. A healthy tension and debate is great, and fiscal prudence is mandatory. Um, I just removed my house, so I get it resonates in birds. You gotta do it. So, okay already, more trail work, and of course, more rail work. Please approve staff recommendation for this next step. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Van Brink. Mr. Barry Scott. First, I want to uh, uh, thank Guy Preston, Director Preston, for all, all the significant work that you've done. I wish you well, and I hope you uh, <laughs> may be able to help us as we uh, go forward. Um, I uh, support this item, and I anticipate approval. Uh, I want to say that I, I, I attended the Caltrain uh, show for their new electric rail vehicles, um, and it reminds me that we're, we're moving forward apace throughout the state with rail projects of Monterey and there's Salinas to Gilroy extension. Um, and I hope that we are, uh, will continue to be a part of this regional rail network. Uh, and remember that the, the rail corridor and the rail line itself, it's an active rail line recognized by the federal government. And we need that corridor for rail, for trail, and for future resiliency and recovery. Uh, we live in a tsunami, earthquake, landslide, world and we bought the railroad for rail transit and I, I just hope we move forward it's very encouraging i want to point to and i thank uh, commissioners for discussing uh, the possibility for applying for additional grants whether they come from the uh, uh, RTIF or cursive or someplace else and it's mentioned on page uh, five and six of this item if desired by the commission staff could return and recommend programming one of these other fund sources for the rail and trail project to reduce the burden on Measure D, reduce or avoid the need for inter-program loans, and assert the match for future grants fully fund the preliminary engineering and environmental analysis. And I, I hope that we see some effort made in that direction uh, so that we lessen the load on Measure D funds. And uh, again, thank you, and uh, thank you, Director Preston. Thank you, Mr. Scott. We have no other speakers. All right, then I will return to the Commission for Action. I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve the staff recommendation. Second. Motion by Commissioner Schifrin, second by Commissioner Rodkin. And, and let me speak to that for a minute if I could. Please, um, Commissioner Schifrin. I was contemplating uh, also making a motion or including in this motion that uh, the Commission um, do follow what the staff mentions um, about applying for funding. Uh, additional funding. But I'm not doing that for a couple of reasons. One, in terms of um, the RTIP, which is all really we're, uh, as I understand it, we're pursuing with uh, item number 28. It's going to mean a big fight at the commission if we would do it. They just even pursue it. And there are all these other projects that are very um, important. And I think um, it doesn't make sense at this point to have that kind of uh, conflict at the commission. I am sympathetic to what Commissioner uh, McPherson said and others that have agreed to. However, I do what I did here is that when the TIRSIP and the rail grants come, when there are really other funding opportunities that could be used directly for rail, um, I think it would make sense for the commission to consider doing that. And for two reasons. One, just like with the highway projects, the Measure D money is really best used as leverage, as a portion of, the, as we've seen with the rail trail projects, as we've seen with the highway projects, Measure D funds are a relatively small percentage of what those projects are costing. And I think it makes sense to be considering rail um, no, the rail feasibility study in the same light, that to the extent that we can get additional funding, uh, which is part of this recommendation, is a 3.4 million to help 
move this project forward, I think it's important. The other thing I wanted to mention in, in that regard is that we're really, from my perspective, very, to be honest about it, this whole project is a result of the failure of Measure D. Um, and the More fact- More recent Measure D, not 16. The, me the last year's Measure D, I think everybody knows which one I mean, and the original Measure D didn't fail. And I think there was a message there that the public wants, does not want to rip up the rail line. They want to consider whether passenger rail is feasible. And the commission very responsibly, I think, uh, immediately decided to move forward with a serious attempt to figure out how feasible that would be, how much it would cost, what it would mean. And I think that's what we're doing. And this is a step to approve this recommendation, is a, is a step moving towards what is a pretty expensive analysis, but an analysis that needs to be done in, a, in order to be able to make that decision. I think um, we're responding to the public by doing that. Uh, I think it's a responsible thing to do. And I also think that to the extent that we can find other sources that would help do that, that would provide the money to get it done uh, as expeditiously as we can, that makes a lot of sense as well. So I think this motion is simply to, uh, ex really what it comes down to is accept the funding that the commission has received and recognize that we want to complete the concept report, and if necessary, we'll use additional Measure D money to do that. Hopefully, we can find other ways of funding it, but if we can't, I think we need to do it. So I, uh, I think it's important to approve the staff recommendations for this item. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Schifrin. Any other comments? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So um, I, I guess the question really is, you have, a, um, you have a study, and it seems to me that you know, results are going to come back. But the important question is, how do you interpret this study? I mean, we've seen in the past that uh, there are a lot, a lot of different um, perspectives on data that enters our minds here up here on the dais, Thank you. Uh, but gets interpreted in an entirely different way. So when I hear that what we need is and will have is with, with a passenger rail, that it will be a robust, integrated, equitable alternative to cars, to me that's naive. Because uh, if history has taught us anything, we have Metro. Now, Metro is, I think, reimagining right now, but um, it's not doing that great. It has all the means of, with new buses, new infrastructure, all the things, but what they're doing is going through a vast study on how to improve their services because the demand just isn't there. So when this study comes back, how will we interpret it? And well, you know, to Commissioner Rockin's point of being open and being honest as to what the results really are. And so I think that's a challenge because, um, you know, the parable of the elephant with the visually challenged men, each had never known what an elephant is. One grabs the trunk and says, this, this is a snake. No, he grabs the tusk. No, this is a, uh, a spear. Uh, the body, it's a wall. So everybody wants to interpret it as, as they it meets their needs, and we can't do that if we're going to be totally honest. So that's my challenge. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. There's no other comments, then we'll proceed with the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any <clears throat> opposed? Any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. All right, thank you, Mr. Gabrant, for the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Christensen, for supporting questions. We all pers yep. thank you. Thank you all to all the staff involved in that. Uh, we'll now proceed with item 28, which is the Regional Transportation Improvement Program call for projects. <laughs> I am not Amy. Amy <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. We like you anyway. Um, Rachel Morricone of your staff uh, stepping in for Amy, who's feeling ill today. Um, so 
I appreciate your patience as I wasn't aware I was presenting this until last night. Um, but before you, but you've heard from me before, most of you, on a very similar topic, which is that every other year, the Regional Transportation Commission is responsible for selecting projects to receive specifically the state transportation improvement program funds that um, flow through the California Transportation Commission. But in addition to those funds, we are responsible for selecting projects to receive certain state and federal funding sources. Those include things like the um, federal surface transportation block grant funds, which because we're a small county, we're allowed to trade them out for state funds um, through the Regional Surface Transportation Program Exchange. Um, the Senate Bill 1 um, program, the local um, partnership program funds, which only exist for our county because we have local voter approved sales taxes. Um, and then there's other funding sources which the commission is responsible for programming funding to, um, for. Those include things like the Transportation Development Act funds, um, some transit funding programs, um, some measure D re regional funds. But before you today, we're just going to focus on. Um, primarily three of the funding sources that the commission has the discretion on selecting projects to receive. Um, and we, we recommend doing this through a consolidated call for projects um, rather than looking at each funding source individually and, and sending out different calls for projects for each of the, the different sources there. So um, there's a little PowerPoint here that Amy prepared um, before you today. Specifically, we're looking for your input on the process that we're proposing to program these funds. Um, that, that includes the evaluation criteria that will be used to evaluate um, submittals and, and project ideas that are submitted by project sponsors. Um, those project sponsors might include the Regional Transportation Commission, um, but also Santa Cruz Metro, the cities, the county, some nonprofit agencies that have public agency sponsors, Caltrans, um, the Health Services Agency, all of the different types of organizations that help deliver projects in our, our transportation projects in our community, UCSC, Cabrillo, there, you know, a lot of folks um, are involved in, in making our transportation system work here. And so I anticipate that we'll see applications from many, if not all of those folks. Um, and then just to go over quickly, the funding sources that are available, we have about $8.6 million estimated to be available through the State Transportation Improvement Program. That is based on the um, Caltrans draft fund estimate, which will be finalized in a couple weeks here. So that number might change slightly. Um, it changed from their initial June estimates to their July estimates based on the state budget. So there are some you know, possible minor changes to that dollar amount but ballpark, we're expecting about $8.6 mil, $8 million out of the State Transportation Improvement Program. We have a larger share of regional surface transportation program funds available. Those do come to us, as I mentioned earlier, based on the Federal um, Infrastructure Act, how much money is set aside there. In our county, we receive about $4 million a year of those funds, and we're recommending programming um, several years of funding um, for that program. Um, and then we have just a small, about $300,000 a year of the local partnership program funds, and we have two years of that available for programming. And we still have some leftover change from uh, so the SoCal to Morrissey Auxiliary Lanes project right away that um, Caltrans didn't end up using that we had secured as a federal earmark. Um, and so we're hoping that we're going to get the opportunity to, quote, repurpose those funds. And so it, rather than issue a call for projects for something like $186,000, we want to just consolidate it here and look at all the different funding sources at one time. Um, we are required to use a performance-based process when we're selecting projects. We can't just decide we're going to fund this project over here and that one over there. The state and the feds guidelines, as well as our own regional transportation plan guidelines, require that we look at what are the benefits of these projects, especially in comparison to other needs in the community, and then make decisions on how we're going to utilize those funds. And so before you today are also evaluation criteria that staff recommends um, utilizing. And this was based on input we've received 
um, both from state and federal guidelines that mandate that we use some of these, but also input that we received from our bicycle committee, our elderly and disabled transportation advisory committee, and the interagency technical advisory committee. Um, specifically at the at all those committee meetings, we received both public comment and comment from your committee members on whether or not to weight some of these criteria to give some things, um, you know, more points or less points or eliminate certain projects if they don't meet some of these criteria. Um, and what staff's recommending and the ITAC is that we continue to look at all of these kind of general categories of evaluation criteria. You know, does the project improve safety and reduce um, um, collisions and fatalities. And just to mention, I'm, these are all outlined in attachment two on your, um, in the staff report that starts on page 2810 of the, of the packet. Um, you know, does it help us preserve our existing transportation system, whether that's repaving roadways or replacing buses that are dilapidated? Um, you know, does it help reduce emissions and reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled that people are traveling? Does it give them more options on how to get around so that they're not limited on, on their um, travel options? Um, will it reduce transit travel times and conduct do better job of connecting all of our local agencies and, and local jurisdictions and making it easier for folks to get from point A to point B. Um, we also want to make sure that we're considering, um, and this is, you know, increased emphasis that um, both Teresa and Arnold focused on earlier today is, you know, what also are the health benefits of our projects and implications of our transportation decisions and, and projects. So taking that into consideration and also taking seriously you know, what are the historic um, inequities that have existed in our communities and who have we not invested funds in and who's having a harder time getting from point A to point B. And so that equity consideration is also um, part of the evaluation criteria that we're recommending. Um, and then of course, what the greenhouse gas emissions impacts are. Um, so those are the primary evaluation criteria that we are recommending that this board sign off on today. It makes decision making a lot easier to just kind of establish here's what we're looking at. We're gonna evaluate projects on these. Um, the ITAC did request that and staff recognizes not every project does every single one of these things. And so part of the recommended evaluation criteria is that if a project just really scores really poorly on one of these things. It's, it's not a system preservation project, perhaps. Um, that's fine. We can eliminate the what they scored, you know, high, medium, low on system preservation out of their overall score, and we'll just um, base it on the other um, five primary criteria. Um, similarly, some projects might mostly be a system preservation project, and maybe they're not going to really do anything as far as greenhouse gas emission reduction. Um, and so we'll, that's fine. We can just take that that component off of their score. So this is what your um, technical advisory committee recommends and staff recommends. Um, in addition to that, all projects have to be consistent with our regional transportation plan. They should be consistent with other planning documents that each of those agencies or the state might have produced through a pretty robust public engagement process, things like the active transportation plans that many of the, I think almost all the jurisdictions have already created. Um, and that these projects also have been built up out of a public engagement process that it, you know, that there's been some level of vetting before someone submits an application to us for this, for these projects. So hopefully the projects that we receive applications for aren't new ideas that somebody hasn't already discussed with the community. Um, and then we'll also be considering the potential risks that different projects might have. So some projects, um, you know, fully funding the project might be a risk that we'd consider, whether or not right away constraints are, are you know, gonna be a challenge for some agencies. We'll also take into consideration, you know, have, have certain project sponsors continually missed deadlines or, or lost funds that previously were um, given by this board and, and, and take that into consideration also. But the primary um, recommendations that we'll be coming for will be based on those evaluation criteria um, currently as presented in an attachment to, although the board could make mo modifications to that today. Um, so with that up on there is our, our general project schedule. What we're recommending is the commission authorized staff to issue a call for projects. We'll get the application out um, 
very soon. Applications would be due at the end of October, and we will have a public hearing at the board's December meeting to make that final selection. Our um, requests to the CTC for the STIP funds are due to the state by December 15th. So that's the only really hard deadline out of any of this. Um, and we do want to make that CTC's deadline because if we don't submit projects for that funding, we might have to wait until 2029 to actually be able to program those funds. Um, the CTC is currently, the majority of the new capacity for new projects is in fiscal years 2025 through 2028 of their existing um, STIP. So just to kind of let you know, we're, we're programming some funds for five years, some of them for two years, some of them for four years. Um, and that is our staff recommendation. So I'll turn it over to you for any questions you might have and go from there. Thank you, Ms. Morricone. Sure. Are there questions or comments from commissioners? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for that report. It seems to me that's a pretty wide swath in terms of re recommend recommendations based on criteria. I mean, you the, there's a whole landscape of of meeting certain qualifications. Um, do you think it's a little bit too broad? to look for projects that can do a lot of different, um, have a lot of different benefits. That fit under the umbrella that you just described. I would say that historically the commission has seen projects that do include all of these things. And I think that, um, you know, especially like something like the Senate Bill 1 um, Solutions for Congested Corridor Program, we were able to put together a a program for the Watsonville to Santa Cruz corridor that included bicycle components, transit lanes, um, highway improvements, um, pedestrian improvements. And so, and I have seen that almost in every cycle from most of the agencies that they are able to put together a project that does consider integrating complete streets, for instance, into a, um, even if it's mainly just a pavement rehab job, that they'll make some modifications. Maybe it's to the bus stop along there or adding a new crosswalk and you know, reflective um, lighting for when pedestrians are, are at the crosswalk. Does that sometimes though uh, create a situation where the, all these additive measures and uh, goodies, if you will, um, um, make the completion or the reality of that project infeasible. I haven't, I haven't seen that in the projects that we've received applications for in the past. Um, I'm sure there are scenarios where that could, that some local jurisdictions decide not to apply for these funds because their project does not advance the regional transportation commis commission's goals and priorities. And they look to other funding sources to, to meet those. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, I just, uh, probably as many things as I get asked to from my constituents is improve the transportation network system. Uh, I just uh, think this, we need, uh, with this presentation, we just need to thank the voters in 2016 Measure D. If that wouldn't have passed and we became a self-help county, we wouldn't be talking about this at all. So uh, just, I just want to remind people how important that vote was to approve so we can have present some options and receive some re rewards from it too. So that's all I want to say. Thank you, Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Schifrin. Yeah, uh, just a quick question. Thank you for the, re for the report. In terms of uh, agencies submitting project requests, can they only uh, request projects that they would carry out for their own, or could they request a more uh, project that is a high priority for them even though they're not going to carry it out. They would need to have to secure an implementing agency to um, implement the project. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Rockin. Okay, I, I don't want to um, scare everybody that I'm about to do this because usually I've, in these in the past, I've accepted the uh, recommendations of staff based on the criteria that we're setting out here. But I just want to clarify, this is a, if, if a scenario were to arise, let's say, for example, where these projects all come in and a bunch of them get award or recommended, but there's not, they're not doing, doing anything about climate change, for, for example, 
you gave that example in your presentation. We still have the possibility here of deciding to change to some different, we don't have to accept the priority list as presented to us by staff through this, am I correct? Um, the commission can make whatever decisions, adjustments, adjustments yeah. um, but the goal of establishing a performance-based process is to try to make sure that we are giving everyone a level playing field when we're looking at their projects and to let them know what the rules of the game are when they're coming in with their applications. No, and, and I, that's why I say I typically tend to look at that list and go, yeah, that we did a good job of balancing all those things and the criteria were the correct one, but just imagine this scenario where we, to, to, I remember the person from the public who commented early, we haven't, uh, we haven't done anything or we're not, about climate change. If we look at this list of things that comes in and there's, you know, we really are short in the area of anything that's really addressing climate change stuff out of this whole list. We, we have the ability to shift something if we decide to do that. My recommendation would be if the commission did want to say if projects increase greenhouse gas emissions, we do not want to provide funding to that project to, to say that today before we issue the call for projects. We did actually discuss specifically that came up at one of the committee meetings as well as equity. If a project actually call, causes more um, inequities that we would eliminate it from consideration. Um, that's not what we're recommending here because I think we're going to be able to project sponsors will be able to balance it out. But that was, those were specifically two things that we looked at saying that would be a deal breaker. I'm not looking for an absolute okay. thing that would, you know, prohibit that from happening or something, but just want to make sure that we have the ability to make some change, some shifts if we decide something's not quite right in the end of all this. And if I could weigh in on that a little bit, um, Commissioner Rodkin, if you remember in our last cycle, uh, staff's recommendation was adjusted by the commission and it was uh, to prioritize system preservation um, higher than some of the projects that we had recommended at the staff level. Um, I think the basis of part of that was not only the condition of some of our roads, but also the availability of uh, competitive funding for some of the other projects that were recommended. Um, and um, so we were interested in hearing your feedback as to whether or not that should be something that staff considers. Um, if a project has um, opportunities to be funded in, in other ways, um, should that be considered um, as, as something that we uh, look at when determining what our recommendation is, or should we, um, you know, just look at this criteria and not worry about that in making our recommendation? Um, a lot of the roadway rehabilitation projects are not um, very competitive in other programs, and yet we still need to maintain our roads. And I think that was the message we heard from this commission <laughs> years ago. Um, and if that is something that this commission is going to continue to prioritize, it's good for us to know uh, prior to us issuing the call for projects. And just to add to that, conversely, you know, another thing sometimes is if a project, if by us providing the seed money, as um, Commissioner McPherson mentioned earlier, <coughs> allows them to access and leverage other grants, you know, is that something that you want to prioritize? So there's, is, so we discussed all these different iterations as well, and and. Just wanted to put that out there as well. So. There isn't anything as far as um, a project's, you know, either competitiveness for other funding sources or you know, seed money for other funding sources in the criteria right now, right? I, I didn't. See. There currently are, is not. Okay. Mm -mm. All right, yeah, I mean, I can I add just a little bit of color to what uh, Executive Director Preston said. I mean, um, and I think what you were getting at as well, Commissioner uh, Rotkin, which is last time we had the discussion, basically, um, you know, ultimately the commission decided to fund uh, more system preservation and some county road projects, including maybe, um, you know, some emergency routes that might not score well as far as, um, you know, VMT goes, but certainly are necessary as far as the resiliency part of uh, addressing climate change goes. Um, 
So I do think that, um, you, you know, that that's an extremely important element, uh, the system preservation. Um, and, and again, going back to the um, last discussion, I think originally staff had recommended that we, for example, fund um, some new zero emission buses for Metro, which I think we can all agree uh, is great. But we said, hey, Metro's going to have other funding sources for those buses. And sure enough, uh, they did, right? Here we are, I think, uh, close to acquiring another 50 um, plus uh, hydrogen buses just with some of these alternative um, state and federal funding sources. Those funding sources are not available to county roads. This is really it when it comes to um, our local infrastructure. So I do think it's extremely important that we add um, an, a, you know, maybe an additional criteria as far as availability of un other funding sources. And I will add, I, I think actually with your point just now, as far as seed money is good too, um, in the county board of supervisors discussion about core money allocation, this is the money we allocate to uh, nonprofits on a, a multi-year cycle. One thing that came up um, that was outside of the criteria we originally considered was that um, some of that money that the county was giving to organizations acted essentially as the local match to draw down more federal dollars. And so by removing one dollar from a project, we were actually losing you know, five for the community. Um, so maybe the additional criteria looks like you know, consideration of other funding sources, both you know, to the positive and negative. The comments or questions from commissioners, uh, Commissioner Sandy Brown. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, yeah, I uh, appreciate the the overview here, and I I, I think that um, the I just wanted to follow up on the comments that made by the chair about those two um, kind of elements, right? So um, leveraging funding and um, other funding sources, I think, should be included in consideration. Um, um, I didn't know exactly how to think about putting them in here because these are really um, kind of broader categories of um, kind of goals based on principles and, and values ar around what we want to fund. Um, but I do think those are, are important and I think they're useful tools for helping uh, potential applicants understand um, what we're looking for. So I just wanted to add my, my agreement on that. I'm not sure how it would fit here, but... Um, would like to see that be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Commissioner uh, Hernandez. Um, I just kind of wanted to dig in and find out a little more about some of the particip participating groups that created some of the language for the Access for All, Public Health and Equity especially, um, and if there's participation from South County to create some of that language. Um, you know, I think that in terms of transportation, when it comes to equity, there is going to be in the near future and even now, you know, the affordable housing that's built, uh, transit oriented development that's being built. And when it's being built now, it's with less parking and we need more amenities for, for uh, bike and pedestrian use, especially for these affordable housing units and transit oriented development units. And it, it, if it's not built, there's going to be a disparity and it's going to contribute to what folks were talking about, about the Vision Zero uh, conversation where we're going to have less parking and try to encourage people not to use cars, right, to use e-bikes or bikes or, or, or to walk, but not have the infrastructure there. Uh, so that's a conversation, that's an equity conversation, I think. And so we have to focus on disadvantaged communities to have those conversations, I think. So I just wanted to chime in that piece in there to see if there's conversations in South County about that, Live Oak possibly, along the corridors, folks that live on the corridors, transit corridors. <clears throat> um, but I'd like to have a discussion offline, not right here, about that with you know folks on RTC staff. Sure, I'll just quickly, a lot of the language that's in attachment to comes from state and federal guidelines in, in some instances, as well as um, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Government and the RTC's regional transportation plans. Um, there are many programs in the state and including some of our peer agencies, do some of them have as their, part of their evaluation criteria, something related to housing and specifically affordable housing and whether or not a project 
um, you know, specific to your, your point, you know, does it facilitate folks using alternatives to driving to new affordable housing places? So that's an example of an evaluation criteria that some communities have added to their evaluation criteria. We did not include it here. Um, I feel like it's it's sort of covered under that access for all, you know, providing more multimodal tra travel options. But it, you're right, currently it doesn't focus specifically on affordable housing developments. And it could if the, if the board would like that too. You know, when it comes to disadvantaged communities, there's uh, Marin County is doing a lot of work with transportation equity and the way it's funded. So it's a good county to look at as well. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. All right, if there are no other comments or questions from the commission, I'll open it up to the public. Anyone here in chambers wish to address us on this item? Seeing none, is there anyone online? We do have a speaker, Lonnie Faulkner. Hello, thank you, commissioners, and thank you, uh, Ms. Marconi, for doing a great job of pinching for Amy. I urge the RTC to be forward thinking in the use of these funds. Um, let's look beyond using these funds to do the same things that led us to the climate crisis we're now facing. Let's ask questions like, how can we make it possible to get more people to places like our county parks without having them to get into their cars? Can we consider shuttles that ensure equitable access to all community members to parks? including Henry Cowell and Fall Creek and those parks along Highway 1, like Wadley Ridge that we spoke of earlier, and many other places. I also urge the RTC to look at efforts that will help us address our serious epidemic of traffic violence, as brought to today's commission by the Community Traffic Safety Coalition report through Teresa and Arnold. Our county is the third worst county in the state of California with respect to the number of pedestrians and bicyclists killed and seriously injured by cars and traffic violence. This has worsened just even in the past few years, and it's become a serious epidemic problem. Infrastructure such as street trees, protected bike lanes, traffic circles, and traffic tables serve to make our streets safer for our most vulnerable which actually makes our streets safer for everyone. Speed kills, so if we can keep speeds down and ways to do that, that would be um, very instrumental in solving this issue as well. Thank you for your time, and we appreciate the consideration. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. We have no other speakers. All right, and I'll return to the Commission for Action. Commissioner Rockin. Second. Move the staff recommendation. Can I, so that does not include consideration of other funding sources? That's correct. Okay. I can speak to that if people want to. But no, that's maybe fine. I just keep quiet. Oh, sure, sure. I mean, I'd be curious to understand more I, why you don't want to include any consideration of other funding sources. I, I'm willing to live with the, uh, having the question, given the question I asked earlier, the um, maintenance thing perhaps overwhelming some of my ideas about how much I would shift towards climate change stuff. But I'm not willing to put something in there that sort of basically moves us further away from funding projects that would get climate change support. And my guess is, you know, you'll be able to make an argument that you'll get some funding for climate change support from somewhere else and not so much for county roads. I don't want to defund county roads. I don't want to not have funding for county roads, but I, I don't want to push it that far in the other direction. So I'm happy with the balance of what our staff has done. Given what happened last year with it, there's a sort of sense of about how that might come to us in terms of the actual recommendations. So that, that's my logic. For All right, thanks. Any further discussion? Commissioner Schiffrin? Yes. Um, I kind of disagree with the maker of the motion on this. I think it is important to look at other, uh, consider other funding sources because um, they can play a really important role as, as we've seen with the Metro buses, uh, which, which the chair pointed out. And, you know, it's, I don't think it should be determinative. I just think it's important information to take into consideration. I don't think it, uh, has it necessarily has any effect on climate change. And I don't think it necessarily has uh, a big effect on um, 
county roads or city roads. I mean, the roads do need to be maintained. And if projects can receive funding, sufficient funding from other sources, so they don't need this funding, and that frees up money that doesn't have that same ability, I think it's, um, I think it's important to be able to recognize that. So I would ask the maker of the motion if he's willing to incorporate it, and if he's not, I'm willing to make an amendment to the motion that would incorporate consideration of alternative funding as one of the criteria to be looked at. Well, let me just say, if I imagine a transit system that has 15-minute service on major arterials throughout the county and run, runs, you know, 15-minute service and has um, and zero emission buses, it'd be, it would be transformative. It would change the way people got around this county. And I'm not sure I'd want to see fun. I'm not arguing that that's what the money should all go to. There will be competitive things that are going on. But I'm not sure I'd want to shift money away from that on the thought that they might, there might be a funding source for that on the idea that, um, you know, maintaining the county roads is so important we should put more money into that than they otherwise would get. So, again, I'm, I'm trusting that our staff are balancing these things and w there is a criteria for maintenance um, of, of effort, which is, the county, I assume that's a county road uh, issue primarily. Um, it seems to me like it's covered now. Um, if you, excuse me, if you wanted to add something, I, the idea that things that get um, where we use it for matching funds, I'd be more inclined towards that as a, um, you know, the direction that we're looking for projects that use the money to match rather than spend it all on the project out of our funding. That makes more sense to me, perhaps. But I, really, the idea, I mean, I don't want to set the thing up right now to, to send instructions to our staff, put this money into county roads. That's what you're sort of asking for, I think. I don't, that's not what I'm asking for at all. Please tr clarify. It, because uh, exactly as what you're saying, there are matching situations where um, the, you know, a, a, a project that might go and ask for full funding from, and it could be a road project, it could be a, um, a, a variety of different kinds of projects. And I think it's all, all I think the, the criteria would do is say, let's consider that, that that becomes part of the consideration of uh, whether how much money to give to a particular project and um, that's pretty important to have that kind of I think it's important to have that information I think it's important to take it into consideration when we're looking at uh, a variety of different kinds of funding projects and maybe the example of the buses is a bad example but I think you know for a number of other kinds of projects there have been times where um, you know we may have put more money into a particular project that it didn't really, you know, through matching possibilities. And I think it's important to know, does it have that money or how likely is it that it's going to get that competitive money? All I, my sense is all I see this added criteria as being is something to, th to think about and to potentially take into, and take into consideration. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to ask for the original motion person. without the amendment that didn't get a second, as I understand it. I'd like to ask yeah. for the original motion. Yeah, so the, the motion was for the staff recommendation, and I was going to ask, I did not hear a second. I didn't make the motion. I was just... No, I it was Commissioner, motion. Commissioner Rock had made the motion. Yo, no, I didn't make a, a, a motion to amend, so... You seconded right. it, didn't you? I seconded yeah. the original okay. motion. I know. And re request... Okay. Okay. Could, Annie, could you clarify what the language is exactly you would propose changing? That one of the criteria would be consideration of alternative funding sources. All right, Commissioner Sandy Brown. Thank you. Loss. Oh, there it is. Um, so uh, just to clarify what we're doing here, I, I believe that um, Commissioner Schifrin is suggesting that that uh, piece, the consideration of uh, alternative possible funding be included in the additional consideration for project evaluation. It's page 2813, is that? It become a sixth or is it a seventh well, it criteria? Uh, 
I don't, I'm not asking, I guess I'm asking Commissioner Schifrin to yes. clarify that it would be in the additional yeah. items, right? So it wouldn't be its own um, additional category. It would be included along with um, consistency and con you know consistency with complete Oh, thank you. So, um, and that makes sense to me. I um, I would ask if that if that is something that we're going to consider here, uh, either as an am amendment or after the the initial motion is is on the f the initial motion that's on the floor is. Um, I guess if the if the maker of the motion is not willing to include these, um, that it would be. Uh, included in additional considerations. And I would just ask um, the potential amender of the motion if we could also include uh, language about leveraging outside funding, external funding as, a, as another criteria. This came up as uh, the chair mentioned during the discussions around core. And we saw at the city of Santa Cruz and at the county, um, programs in that, that case that were not that were not being funded, which meant in some cases like a nine to one match, and that was money that was not coming into our county. So I think um, looking at those matches is important as well. And I just, um, however we proceed here, if we could if we could include those both, um, and if the maker of the motion doesn't want to include that, I, I would amend it as well. I think you should make the amendment. All right, commissioners, um, Chris and Brown. I just have a quick question about what was just said. So you Sorry. suggested that that be an additional criteria, but I think where I'm getting confused is there are criteria and then there are considerations. I, so are you suggesting that be an additional consideration? Consideration. Consideration. Okay. Uh, sorry, I used the wrong term, but the, the there's a category there, or there's a heading, which is pretty much all of page 28, 13. <laughs> that's where it would go. I was just confirming with the with Commissioner Schiffer and that that's what he was talking about. And it, and that I think makes sense in this case. Yeah. So I would make a motion to amend the motion on the floor that we add as additional considerations, the availability of un, other funding and the potential for leveraging um, as additional considerations. I'll okay. second that. Okay, motion to amend by Commissioner Schifrin, second by Commissioner Brown. Is there any further discussion? I just want to ask staff, does this complicate the process, pure and simple? I don't think it does. And, and on the last page, the first bullet of the last potential re, uh, risk section is about funding. It's not specifically these funding issues. It's more, you know, is is the project fully funded or not? And, you know, does the agency have the ability to, you know, deal with unanticipated cost increases? I don't think it complicates it at all. What we're going to get out of the evaluation criteria, those, those core evaluation criteria, is a score. And it will show this project project scored 10 and that one scored two. And if you, if we recommend the one that got two instead of 10, maybe it's because it, the one that got 10 points wasn't consistent with our regional transportation plan and it didn't have any kind of public engagement involved in it. Whereas the one that got two is, you know, going to be able to get 10 to $1 return from the feds. So I, I, I you know, I don't, but it just, the goal here is just to make it transparent. That's our ultimate goal here is to make our decision making process very transparent, both to the project sponsors, the public and to one another. So I don't think it's a problem. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. So I guess my question is why go through the crucible of the committees that make all these recommendations, criteria and so forth, if we're all of a sudden just doing an impromptu, um, you know, reconsideration and, uh, you know, ch changing, I mean, um, the goal is that we'd be able to articulate. So if, if we don't use the hard score only and we're taking into consideration these other factors that we're able to articulate to the community, why? Yeah, and, and I'm supportive of the um, amendment because I think as Commissioner Schifrin explained, um, it will ensure consistency, more consistency of information as far as the way that we look at all of these uh, the, the projects that apply. Um, you know, if we don't list it at all, then 
people won't discuss it at all in their application. And then we could be in a situation as we were with CORE where um, we end up pulling money from a project that can get nine to one matching funds simply because that wasn't discussed at all uh, when they submitted those applications. We didn't have any consistency of information across the different applications to make that decision. So um, I'm supportive of the amendment. Any further discussion? All right, then we'll start with a vote on the amendment. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the amendment passes. Now we have to vote on the main motion, which is the amended motion. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the well, amended just motion Just let me clarify passes. that the motion we just approved is a staff recommendation with the amendment. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Correct. It's not just the amended motion. That's, right. That's correct. Okay. That brings us to the end of uh, item 28. Thank you, Ms. Morricone, for the presentation. And we'll now be moving into closed session. RTC Council Mattis, is there uh, any reportable actions we anticipate from closed session? Um, there is the possibility of a reportable action from closed session. Okay. Thank you. Well, that uh, concludes the public portion of our meeting. Well, I suppose if we, do we is there any time that we'd anticipate coming back if there is a reportable action? I would anticipate uh, not more than 30 minutes. Okay. So that would be uh, about 12.40. Uh, Does that mean that we do have to come back or we don't have to come back? We don't have to, but somebody has to come right. back. Out the chair. Okay. Right. All right. We'll now move into closed session. Thank you. <laughs>